This is ABC News with David Rowlands. The last post rang out in suburban streets this morning as thousands commemorated Anzac Day at home amid cancelled dawn services due to coronavirus. Holly Tregenza has this report. There were no veterans marching toward the Australian War Memorial in Canberra, though people did turn out onto the street, but only as far as their driveways. With dawn services cancelled around the country, thousands tuned in to the commemorative service broadcast from the capital. Prime Minister Scott Morrison honoured veterans in isolation or working at the front line of the COVID crisis. Lest we forget. Those who couldn't attend a service paid their respects by lighting a candle before dawn and observing a minute silence at 11am. Thousands of Victorians have taken part in driveway dawn services across the state. In the Melbourne suburb of Malvern East, dozens of people stood in their driveways with candles and watched local resident Graham Conroy play the last posts on his trombone. Local resident Megan Keyes says it was very special for the community. It was really lovely to be able to do this together. I guess it's always a, a bit of a sombre time, but it's a really nice time to reflect and um, it was beautiful that it could be a local neighbour who was able to play it. In Western Australia, many took the opportunity to mark Anzac Day despite the social distancing restrictions can- being cancelled because of the coronavirus pandemic. Across the state, people answered the RSL's call to stand on their driveways and join services broadcast online, on radio and on TV. Among those was Dawn Scoggings, who gathered with her neighbours in East Perth to hold their own service. She said it was heartening to be able to remember her father, who served in the South African Navy in World War II. It means a huge amount and we're very fortunate in this apartment block that this was organised amongst the residents that we could still pay tribute. The national coronavirus death toll has risen to 80 after a 90-year-old man from Tasmania's northwest passed away from COVID-19. The Premier Peter Gutwin says a 90-year-old man from the state has taken the death toll in Tasmania to 10. The man was being cared for at the Mersey Community Hospital. Mr Gutwin says his thoughts are with the man's family at this sad time. Four new infections at a nursing home in Sydney's west are among a dozen extra COVID-19 cases reported in New South Wales. Two residents and two staff members at Anglicare's Newmarch House tested positive in the last 24 hours. It follows the death of a 96-year-old resident yesterday, the fifth fatality at the site. Meantime, the Victorian government says there's been three new cases of coronavirus diagnosed in the state overnight. One of them is a new case at a Melbourne psychiatric facility that has had an outbreak of COVID-19. Queensland has recorded two more coronavirus cases overnight, while health authorities are also in the process of contacting passengers who flew on flight VA341 from Melbourne to Brisbane on Monday after a person on that flight tested positive for COVID-19. The death toll from COVID-19 continues to climb as it passed 195,000 today. Miles Holbrook-Walk has the latest. As some European countries consider easing restrictions, the US reached a grim milestone, passing 50,000 deaths, double the toll of any country in the world. US President Donald Trump now says he was being sarcastic when suggesting sunlight and disinfectant could be used to treat COVID-19. Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro has drawn more criticism over his response to the pandemic as he sacked another government minister. Brazil has recorded more than 3,000 deaths. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has warned Africa is yet to see the worst of the virus and is extremely vulnerable. A 99-year-old British Army veteran has become the oldest person in the UK to reach number one on the British singles charts. Captain Tom Moore has featured along with a choir of health workers and theatre stars in a version of You'll Never Walk Alone to raise money for the National Health Service. Captain Moore has already raised more than $50 million and says despite the pandemic, things will get better. But I think we must also remember that things will get better. There's no doubt there will be one day when things get better, when the sun will shine again, and then we will never have a walk alone. And prisoners in Argentina have staged a demanding vigil, uh, demanding more hygienic conditions and other measures amid the spread of COVID-19. Some inmates at Villa Devoto Prison in Buenos Aires climbed onto the roof of armed with makeshift weapons. You're up to date with ABC News. Nice bit of shepherding by Frame Barton. Goal. It's a goal. No. Yes, it is. Pooped in towards goal. He's got Hudson. Centering kick for Brownless. Sets himself. Atlas. Atlas.
Netflix market. You watch the fight, Doug, I'll watch the footy. Look at left foot. Look at that big pack of balls. Right mark to Royce Hart. Compton picks up the ball, slams it, go, and puts it through. Sheldon picks it up, but they not over, go! Who's there? Schimmel Bush and Bremner. In comes Egan Knight, takes the magnificent mark right over the top. On ABC Radio and ABC Grandstand Digital. And there's the siren. This is Vintage Grandstand. Hello and welcome to Grandstand's new Saturday afternoon offering on Vintage Grandstand. We'll be digging deep into the ABC's extensive archives and replaying the radio commentary of classic matches from years gone by. And each week we'll be joined by key players to get their reflections. Today we've pulled out a 1971 vintage the VFL Grand Final between Hawthorne and St Kilda. It's a match remembered as one of the most brutal in the history of the game. And for the Hawks, superb come from behind victory. I'm Alistair Nicholson. I'll be joined this afternoon by Matt Clinch. Hello to you, Clinchy. Hello, Al. Good afternoon to you and good afternoon to our listeners. It's good to talk a bit of footy, be it a little bit different, before you and I were both born. And uh, looking forward to going back over this Grand Final. Some of the headlines, which I was just looking back on the newspaper, Kamikaze heroes, football takes a back seat. The Hawks, zap, 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 out go the Saints. And an article which was written by Bobby Davis which said, the days the rules went out of the game. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a little platform for what we're going to build over the next couple of hours. We've got a, a great uh, group of people who will be part of the story today with their reflections. Peter Hudson, who was going for a 151 goals in a season. He got oh so close to breaking Bob Pratt's record from 1934. And uh, the storyline around uh, Hudson failing to, to reach that mark is quite extraordinary given the events of the day. Mark McClure was just a youngster who was about to make his way in the VFL. He went on to play in three premierships with the Carlton Football Club, and he's joined us as well. G'day, Sellers. Thanks, boys. It's one of the great games of all time. Tough as, if you actually get a chance to watch it, do so, and you'll understand why. It's unbelievable. Was this symptomatic of the era, that it was oh. it was a tougher era to play football? Uh, I just think it was uh, the, there was much more leniency in those those days about what what happened with uh, concussions and bits and pieces and all that. But it was hard. It was tough. It was honest. Uh, it wasn't a year of, era of sledging. You didn't, no one did all that sort of stuff. It was like if you keep your mouth shut, or you get it filled in, and that's what it was like. And uh, and and you'll hear it. Every clash is just magnificent. And and they stand up. No one died. They just kept going. It's all part of the game. Uh, and it went on for some years after as well. I really enjoyed uh, watching this. And I went back through it again and had a look at it. And you have a listen to some of the names of the players in, this, in these teams that are just spectacular. You know, you've got Kelvin Moore, David Parkin, who's in that side. Uh, and on Bustle, you've got also Ian Bremner from the halfback flank, really strong and tough. And then you go through the middle, you had Rice and Angus and Ma. Ketty, Bobby Ketty ends up kicking the... Wins the game for them, in a sense, in that area there. And then you've got Hudson, Martello, unbelievable side. Um, Lee Matthews, Don Scott, arguably best on ground in this game. Uh, and then you've got Bruce Stevenson as well. Peter Crimmins uh, died from cancer and, and gone. And then, so you have a look at the next side. And then you've got Bobby Murray. What a player. Unbelievable player. Cal, uh, uh, Cowboy Neal. Gary Colling will be talking to him. Barry Lawrence, if you could find someone tougher than him, give us a yell, please. <laughs> he was an unbelievably good player. Bazanko there. Uh, Glenn Elliott. Stewie Trott. You know, you got uh, Barry Breen. Not that tough. Anyway, uh, <laughs> no, I, Barry's a really good player. Barry good will be player. with us as the well point this afternoon. Breen, yeah. yep. Point kicker, he's there. Uh, Mighty Minot. You know, Travis Pays. Ross Smith. It goes on and on. It's an incredible, both, they finished one and two for the season. Hawthorne finished first with 19 wins, and they finished with 16 wins, St Kilda. Uh, and they'd already won the uh, 60, the uh, 66 Premiership, and they'd only won one each yes. at this stage. 61 for Hawthorne, and they were sitting there waiting to see what happens. And it goes right to the wire, which has been fantastic. First and only grand final between St Kilda and, and Hawthorne that we've we've ever witnessed. So we wait for the the next chapter. And this was an absolute beauty. Momentum swings, brutality, a lot of off the ball hits. Um, the one most famous probably is involving a man you mentioned, Cowboy Neil and Peter Hudson. Peter Hudson will be with us uh, later on today um, to discuss the match where he was going for that that record of 151 goals. He got to 150, kicking three in the first half, and couldn't find that extra goal despite all of the, the circumstances that you'll hear that unfolded late in the game when he had many opportunities to do it. And I actually heard you say he failed. 
to make 150. What about making 150? That's 150 no failure. <laughs> that is no failure. He was averaging seven goals per game. So three, four seemed like a relatively easy achievement. Uh, vintage Grandstand, we're looking back at the 1971 VFL Grand Final. If you remember it, if you were there, 0437 774 774. Al Nicholson, Matt Clinch and Mark McClure. It seems only fitting that we start with the captain of the Hawks in that 1971 Grand Final. David Park and, of course, part of our Grandstand team. Parko, welcome. Thanks, Crinchy. Yeah, good uh, good memories. Is it the toughest grand final you've played in or seen? Um, I think oh, I've just been reading uh, Tony Wilson's book, I think, on um, 1989, uh, the great grand final. I think they probably uh equal in terms of physicality and degree of difficulty and closeness of scores and all of those things. I think those two games probably rate fairly evenly. Uh, when you're up there playing, it's a bit hard to, uh, to, work to make those sort of judgments. What was the mindset heading into the, the grand final? St Kilda had had this incredible second half of the season, the two famous coaches with John Kennedy at Hawthorne and Alan Joyce at the Saints. What Can you remember your mindset heading into the grand final about the likelihood of winning? Oh, yeah. Well, I think we, if our memory serves me right, we played in the second semi final. And probably got up by a similar, uh, about two, two points. points. It was, was two, it points. two points in the second two points, I remember that. And that was a clear indication of the, can I say, the equality or the equal performance of both those sides. I mean, they were, I think hear sellers there naming the, the, uh, talent that was in, gee, talent and experience. I'm mm. not sure uh, whether we were more experienced or they were across the board, but, you couldn't have got two more even teams in terms of, um, you know, ability and talent and uh, commitment, motivation, all those sort of things. So I, uh, I, I found it as a player when I when got a lot of goals kicked on me too. I don't like to talk about that, but I think uh, <laughs> I wasn't a particularly good player on that on that day. Oh, but, Parko, um, you're outstanding. You had a great game. Well, Clinch and I watched it during the week and were commenting how well you played. Well, we keep bird. talking. That's good. Well, you tell a few other people. That. <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm not sure that Bonnie Smith or Theodore would have thought that because I reckon they kicked somewhere between four or five uh, against me on that particular day. But look, you know, it's funny. You know, looking looking back at footy, and I've been lucky enough to be involved in, I suppose, five grand finals, uh, four of them as a coach. But to play and captain in front of about 100-odd thousand people at the MCG in a close game like that, people say, what's your greatest memory in football? And little doubt, and so I know Sellers is sitting there, that 81 and 82, which he was a part of, which was a sensational time for us. But uh, for me, the 71 side, um, or that particular game, and the fact that we got over the line in a close one, still remains the greatest football memory for me. The two coaches, David. Are they in the top echelon of their career? The top, the top numbers of any coaches in the competition, or probably in the world, they were fantastic, both of them. Yeah, that, that's true. And, and interesting, as uh, life's gone on and we've got to know both, we've certainly lost Alan Jones, which has been really sad, but the connection he had with that group and then coming to Hawthorne afterwards. And, of course, John's still firing along, JK, and... Uh, probably the most influential person in the lives of all of those of us who had an opportunity to be coached by him and uh, uh, that, that's a great, what's the word, offset for um, the game that we played that day. We know a little bit about St Kilda. In 16 years he was there, uh, Alan yeah. Jones. He had played him in nine finals and for a, yeah. for one premiership only. But then he went to Hawthorne and then he started in uh, in 1982. He ran third. Yeah. In replaced 83. Me. For, oh, well, me. that's yeah. a very good call. Anyway, <laughs> obviously it worked. Anyway, so then you go, he goes, he goes third, uh, first, second, second, first, second. Alan Joyce takes over, wins, probably one of his. He come, then he yep. comes back. Alan Joyce take, uh, Alan Jeans comes back, wins again, fifth. Yep. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary. The, the, the actual yeah. record of this guy, 400 and, uh, uh, 500 and whatever ever game, 575 mm. games, 332 wins, incredible mm. record, 65 or 66 uh, percent win loss ratio over that ma- ma- that number. And coaching St Kilda too, who have, have been, you know, we know that they've had area. That's their best area ever when he was there. True. The only premiership, the only premiership was yep, coached yep. by, by uh, Alan. Oh yeah, look and. 
fortunately, later in life, and particularly in those last year or two, I got to know him very well. And it's it's interesting that he and John Kennedy, in terms of personality and delivery, I guess, or leadership style, or whatever you like to call it these days, yeah. were so similar. So it was in yeah, they were. nature and the relationship that they had with their players. I usually sit down with talk to Bertie DiPierre or Dermot or one mm. of those, and the relationship, and, and they both played under Kennedy as well. I think I might both played under Kennedy. Yeah. And the relationship they had with Alan was just um, unbelievably did good. You, did you go to his funeral? I was there as well. And they yep. had the police commissioner at the time, I can't remember his name, um, said he was the best leader the police force had ever seen. Yeah. In the yeah. history of him being involved, yeah. and it doesn't—it uh, sort of relates when you think about it to what he's done. Yeah, yeah, ab- absolutely. And uh, you know, basic person. I mean, we used to get a bit of uh, Kennedy was fantastic. We in the pre-match address, we get a bit of the Bible and a bit of Churchill and a bit of Karl Marx, and we get all these stuff. And I was in the front <laughs> row. I was—I was enthused by most of the base were born out of their brain. <laughs> Any humour? <laughs> yeah, but uh, to to hear them. And Jeans was the same apparently when they really wound up and, uh, and, and had a meaningful point to make, etc. I can, it's interesting because Scotty, he was brilliant on that particular day because I think at three quarter time, John, you know, in a funny sort of a way suggested that, um, well, we, you know, we, we mightn't get up. But he said something like his last words was for something like, let's go down gloriously, you know, like you know, give it the best shot. <laughs> and and uh, and he walked away as he does. Don Scott, I was the captain, but Don Scott pulled him back in. He said, what's he talking about? <laughs> Losing, he said, we'll kill this mob. And if you, and you've watched it, if you, yeah. if the first set of bounce after three-quarter time, Don jumped up and I reckon hit the ball to centre half forward. It bounced over the top of um, um, Martello and I reckon... Teddy or someone ran onto it and kicked the first goal within seconds of Scotty making that demand against the backdrop of what John Kennedy had said. David Parkins with us, the captain of Hawthorne's winning 1971 grand final side. You're on Vintage Grandstand with Alistair Nicholson, Matt Clinch and Mark McClure as well. Don Scott's going to be with us later on. We'll have Gary Colling and Barry Breen from the Saints to join us and Peter Hudson and Don Scott uh, in addition to David Parkin from the Hawthorne side of things. Parko, can you um, put a finger on or explain why that match was so brutal, even by the standards and the very different nature of football of the day? There were just so many incidents. Um, Matthews, you know, on Stuart Trot. Uh, we had Hudson and, and obviously Cowboy Neil early in the game. Um, Carl Ditterich seemed to be a, a target for many. Robert yeah, Day got knocked out. Yeah. yeah. Well, why do yeah. you think that was? Well, look, I've got, to, I've got to say this because Scotty ran with us on. He said, for goodness sake, don't use your normal line. But they played the first half without the ball. <laughs> so I'm, 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 I'm putting that in. But when Scotty comes on, you can say, Park and said they played the first half without the ball. But for whatever reason, and I'm still not sure, you've named about four or five, another four or five that I could name, which were genuine, brutal, hard and... Big often Carl. reportable, but not uh, not not done on the day. It sort of became an acceptable manner which that game was played, and it was it was uh, absolutely brutal. Bob Day was knocked out early in the game and can't remember a thing. Hutto was knocked out a bit later, and he can't remember anything. Uh, it, it certainly was a very very physical game, and, and if you go back in that year, I think we played them three times. I think we played them three times in that year. They are all very physical, very brutal games, which had those sort of knocks, a bit of violence, some reports, etc. It was just the St Kilda Hawthorne bit, um, and, uh, and and we'll remember it forever as such. And what do you remember about the storyline around Peter Hudson? I mean, a grand final is a huge thing for any club, I suppose, especially when you've only won one before, and that was the case for both Hawthorne and St Kilda. But then for Peter Hudson, you had this added, um, I guess, expectancy that he's going to break Bob Pratt's record. As Clinchy mentioned earlier, he's averaging seven goals for the season. Mm -hmm. He only needs four goals on grand final day. You look at his matches that year, as you mentioned, against St Kilda, you played three times, and Hudson had kicked, I think it was 26 goals in those three games. So I think it was justified that everyone just thought he was a a lay-down to to break the record. What what are your memories of it? Yeah, that's interesting because, and I think... um, 
Sellers said a few minutes ago, Bob Murray is a mate of mine, knew him at school, um, beautiful bloke and a beautiful player. And that contest between Hudson and Moe I always look forward to. But in each of the cases, including the grand final, um, he he was undone, undone by Peter Hudson. If you've seen the hit, and I'm at the other end of the ground, so I don't see much going on, but I saw Peter Hudson here at half time, <laughs> and it was split in two. You know, they were trying to tape it up and hold it together, but it needed an year to be, be stitched up. So he certainly, Cowboy Neil certainly had got him. And you talk to Peter, he won't... I'm sure he won't remember anything of the game at all because he got into position three times in normality in front of goals to be able to kick what, what when in his terms, would have been easy gifts um, and and missed the whole three. Kicked the man on mark on one and the other two went off. So he was certainly not able to play in the normal manner. It was a brutal, it's, it's shown in the film, it's a brutal hit that Cowboy delivered. Carl Dietrich uh, got um, um, into a contest as well and uh, it sort of sorted him out too. I haven't seen him after that. He hardly touched the ball. Yeah, well, apparently he was... Yeah, Alan, uh, Alan James tells the story. He was, he was gone by half-time and for whatever reason didn't think he could go on. And uh, I think Alan threw the gauntlet down for him to actually come up. But the moment and it was a skinny bloke called Ray Wilson we mentioned before, number 10, mm. and he came off the bench, I think, and I'm not sure it was legitimate, but he certainly hit him with a <laughs> forearm across the jaw, <laughs> and I think that might have been the end of Cal for the day, because I don't think, um, you might be right, but I can't remember the game well enough to know, but I don't think he made any sort of an impact as Carl could do in the second half of the game. No, he's a superstar player and a dashing player, but uh, all of a sudden he went, went missing. Michael <laughs> Porter claims victory for that. Oh, well, that, that might be right, too. I don't we, think we, so. Oh, there is a genuinely huge haymaker that Michael Porter throws at, uh, at Carl Ditterich during the match. There's no doubt about that. I'm not sure whether it connected, Parco. And funnily enough, umpire Shields, the only umpire officiating, is. Yeah. He missed it. Case. He couldn't believe it. I think he paid a kicking in danger free kick <laughs> <laughs> to someone else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't know, mate. I, but, but, that's the trouble with playing down the, the back end or down the back point. You miss half the bit of action. Hey, Dave, <laughs> uh, coaching in those days, and you were, weren't long after those guys coming in to coach when you when you finished, you had a, an assistant, you had a runner, <laughs> and you had no any computers in the room? I didn't see any. <laughs> no, no, uh, no. And you had to make your own decisions. That's unbelievable, isn't it? What sort of coaches they are? <laughs> it, it might have made the game a bit more enjoyable to play, though, so Oh, totally. Don't worry about that. We could go out and play our own our own game without too much tactical or strategic uh, efforts. But uh, if you've got 16 coaches now, Sellers, so someone's got to be uh, burning their keep by giving you a job today. <laughs> I don't think they're going to have it anymore. Oh, I, are you liking what you might see as a result of this? Oh, I think we might. It's become ridiculous in a sense and it's mm. an arms race and the wealthy uh, get get more and uh, mm. the unwealthy or the or the or the lesser, lesser can't likes. do it yeah, yeah. so, so I, I actually think that uh, it's unnecessary finally Paco, what were the celebrations like pretty good i think from uh from memory but I'm, I'm not good we had a few since then which uh, sellers was a part of and uh, they 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 knew how to celebrate um i think we celebrated right before under- <laughs> yeah. We were celebrating during the week, <laughs> and people people who are listening to this might think that's that's uh, a joke, but it's not. <laughs> now, Parker, that was a pretty special any Premiership Cup special, but only your second to go into the the Glen Ferry Trophy cabinet. So it's yes. a pretty special yeah. one, but not all that certain you treated it as, as such. You didn't have oh. the white gloves on that day, did you? <laughs> Uh, I did travel. They said, "What were you worried about, Little Nick?" I actually, in the last few minutes, tackled I think Theodore, and because in those days, cells on that might in yours. I think in those days they had the little metal uh, things on the side of your shorts. You could pull them in and make them tighter. And uh, I went to tackle Theodore and took my middle finger instead of being the longest one. There was the same as the rest. Cause I took the top off the finger. And I was in a bit of pain. I'm not very good with pain. <laughs> and when I came down from receiving the cup, which I think you've all seen now, but I've been putting the cup, I went to hold up and it hurt my finger. <laughs> so I dropped the cup and <laughs> smashed it, which uh, if, if anybody ever remembers, all the golden stuff around the side of the cup fell off and we had to get it, uh, get it fixed up afterwards. So not a great memory of mine after the game. 
Parco, thanks for reliving some memories with us. Nice to take us back to 1971. Thanks, Quincy. Good to talk, Alistair and Charles. Thanks, Mark. Congratulations. Well it's David Parkin joining us on Vintage Grandstand on Grandstand Digital and via the ABC Listen app. Matt Clench, Mark McClure and Al Nicholson with you. So it's probably time to start our trip down memory lane. Do you want to set the scene, Al? We'll start in the first quarter. Yeah, let's go to the ABC archives here for the radio call. We're going to bring you almost all of the game in its entirety this afternoon and filter through a few chats with some of those greats that participated as well. But let's kick things off with the opening term from the 71 grand final. Well, a fantastic atmosphere for the 1971 Grand Final. Players now dispersing to their respective positions. The Hawthorne side kicking to the punt road end. And St Kilda will be kicking to the scoreboard end for the first quarter of the 1971 Grand Final. Our broadcast is going throughout Australia and also to many parts of the world. And a special welcome, too, to our troops in Vietnam. Of course, I'm fortunate enough to be able to uh, witness this magnificent spectacle, one of the spectacles that uh, is unique in Australian sport. Both forward lines extremely open, and of course, as was expected, the centre is very crowded indeed. In fact, the only two players on the forward line virtually in Hawthorne's attacking the area are Peter Hudson and Bob Murray. The half-forward flanks are right up in the centre, and the centre half-forward is also on the edge of the square. There's the bounce, the start of the 1971 Grand Final, Play still on the centre. Opportunity for Lawrence to get first boot to the ball, which he does. Out towards the centre wing on the member's side. David Parkin can't collect the ball. The opportunity for Bonnie. Twisting, dodging and weaving. Can't get an effective boot to it. Now he tries to kick it off the ground. Umpire Shields paying the kicking in danger rule. And the free kick has gone to Angus. Angus towards the half-forward line for Hawthorne. Nobody able to mark the ball. Keddie's bustled out of the way. Mara in there also for Hawthorne. Taken by Stuart Trott. His kick towards the centre wing. Play on the member's side of the ground. Theodore on top of the ball. And Umpire Shields giving Theodore the free kick. His kick's a shocking one. And he travels 10 yards to Elliot. Elliott's handball under pressure goes towards the half-forward line, but knocked away by Don Scott. It goes to Stuart Trott. Trot on the centre wing, can't collect the ball. Keddie's well down from half forward. He's almost on the half back line. Collected well by Gary Conning. Conning's kick towards full forward. Hawthorne in front, can't mark the ball. Big Burley Hawken leaves the pressure and he's pumped to the ground by Dittrich. And umpire Shields moving in, having a word to Carl. And the free kick is going to Hawken of Hawthorne. Well, Dittrich, who played such a fantastic game in last week's preliminary final. He's certainly giving the warning to the Hawthorne players that uh, that's the way he's going to play today. All 16 and a half stone of him is going to be used for the best way that he can. Hawken with the free kick and a long 65 yarder to the centre wing. Martello in front. Lawrence up very high. Nobody able to mark the ball. Minot in there trying to knock the ball clear. Nobody able to break clear at the moment. Centre wing member side. Judson who's been a great back pocket for the scene throughout the year carries the ball across the boundary line for a throw in. Centre wing member side. One minute of play in the grand final. No score. Minot contesting with Scott. Ball goes up and down in the one spot. Angus with the ball, drops it like a hot cake and then is tackled and is lucky to get the free kick. Angus to boot Hawthorne back into attack. Towards the half-forward line it goes and Heath had the mark and dropped it to recover as well. Kevin Heath to boot Hawthorne deep into attack towards Hudson. Hudson and Murray. Hudson front position. He's got the mark. Magnificent positioning of the body by Peter Hudson. He's a long way out from goal. Right on the boundary line and all of 65 yards from goal. Hudson, who needs four goals today to break Bob Pratt's long-standing goal-kicking record, sends an enormous punt kick on its way. It could be there. It's a goal. Well, that's the goal of the final series and possibly the goal of the year by Peter Hudson. It was a 70-yarder, an impossible angle and an impossible distance, but nothing's impossible for Peter Hudson. Hawthorne, one goal. St Kilda yet to score. Roy Wright and then Thorold Merritt. Well, a great... A morale booster for Hudson so early in the game. He outpositioned Murray beautifully and then drove in, as you said, Peter, an enormous uh, lit distance in the kick. Goal number 147 for Peter Hudson as the ball is bounced again. Scott comes through the pack, tries to get his boot to ball, can't, but eventually it's Rice who gets it up towards Hudson and Murray. But Murray on this occasion outwitted uh, Hudson and led him to the ball and took a diving mark. Murray limping too thorough. Yes, he seemed to jar his right knee there, Roy, as he landed... <coughs> Flat on it, and he's not in the best of health, is uh, Bob Murray. Up towards the centre wing, his kick goes. A chance for Minot. He uh, lets the way go for Manzi as his ball is driven up towards half forward. uh, Breen. Breen kicks it off the ground and out of play in the forward pocket in front of the members' stand. 
One goal, six points to uh, Hawthorne. St Kilda yet to score after three and a half minutes in the first quarter of the grand final for 1971. The first times these sides have met in a grand final. Ruck throw in again. Up goes Big Dietrich and Scott. Neither gets the tap down. It's tapped down by uh, Parkin. Out towards uh, Crimmins who boots it off the ground and gets it out of danger for Hawthorne. Down towards the half-forward flank. Up flies Ma. He was interfered with and he'll take the free kick. Half-back flank left for Hawthorne. He dummies around his man on the marks. Uh, trot. Drives it down towards centre wing. Uh, flying up there is uh, Stevenson. He's interfered with but play goes on. A chance for Colling. He gets uh, his body in front and will get the free kick, Gary Colling as he cops one on the left ear too, on the centre wing out of side. Hawthorne one goal, St Kilda yet to score. Six minutes gone in the grand final here at the MCG. Colling a kick up towards the half forward line, Bustle there, jostling uh, Breen out. It goes to Elliott, he's at centre half forward, loses possession. Coming down the field at the moment is Manzi, a rifle kick in towards the forward pocket. Parkin running to the ball, but the ball will beat him over the line, and there'll be a throw in in St Kilda's right forward pocket, only about ten yards around from the behind post. St Kilda kicking towards the town end. Dittrick going up with Hawkins. Dittrick gets the tap down but goes to Crimmins. Crimmins swings the ball up towards centre half back. A chance here for Martello. He so slips over the crucial moment. It goes to Lawrence. Lawrence a handball to Stuart Trott. He breaks clear. A short pass in towards centre half forward. A chance here for Theodore. Gets it across towards uh, Moran. Moran's in the forward pocket. Oh, he's slipping and sliding everywhere. And the ball eventually forced over the line for a throw in. Wasting a lot of chances, St Kilda. Throw in on the half forward line. St Kilda into attack. Up goes uh, Scott. Gets the tap down, but it goes to Rossi Smith. Smith uh, over the shoulder, up towards full forward. A chance here for Dietrich. The ball going free at the moment. St Kilda come in through uh, Theodore. He's got the ball on the left foot, and Theodore's put it through. Hawk and limping very badly, Peter. The first goal to St Kilda coming up after seven minutes in this grand final, and the scores are level. Hawthorne a goal, St Kilda a goal. Hawthorne's goal from Peter Hudson, making his total to 148, and Theodore's goal for St Kilda. Yes, uh, Roy, it looks as if Ken Beck's going to be on the ground in uh, Very early. 20 seconds. Uh-huh. No Hawkins staying on, but it won't be long, I wouldn't think, before he goes off and Ken Beck moves on. From the centre bounce once again, umpire Shields bounces the ball. Knocked down by Mind, it goes up towards the half-forward line, but it's uh, uh, Stevenson getting the ball on the left foot up towards the member side wing. Players coming to it now. It's St Kilda overrun the ball through Manzi, but he recovers well. A short one in towards Ross Smith. Ooh! And Matthews coming the opposite way, and they met heavily. And uh, Ross Smith bit the dust, but he was quick to get up. Matthews, a hand pass across to Robert Day. Day up towards centre half forward, and I think it's Heath who's marked. Handball across to Desmar. He breaks clear from centre half forward, and the ball has gone through for one behind. Hit by Desmar. Very quick passage of play by Hawthorne on that occasion. Moving the ball well, moving it fast. Not giving their opponents a chance to recover once they get that ball moving up on the half-forward line. Hawthorne, one goal, one seven. St Kilda, one goal. They've played nearly eight minutes in the first quarter. Bob Murray kicks out, favouring the outer side flank. They set themselves up there, and Scott it is, I think, who's taken the mark for Hawthorne. Very deep on their right half-forward flank. Scott coming in now, oh, it's a long kick by Scott, it's going to be very close, up they go and it's been forced through for one behind to Hawthorne, off the boot of their ruckman Don Scott. Hawthorne one two eight. ace, St Kilda one goal at the eight and a half minute mark. The well, player's getting tremendous distance towards that Richmond end of the ground. Yes, the wind must be favouring that in Roy. In fact, rain is falling now at the Melbourne Cricket Ground too as Murray boots out towards the half-back flank looking for Big Dittrich. He can't mark the ball over the back. It goes and Minot has to try and use his pace. He knocks it cleverly towards the centre wing to Moran. Moran could have handballed but decided to kick it himself towards the half-forward line to no one in particular. David Parkin coming out to meet it. The ball knocked away from him by Breen. It comes back to Parkin. He's dragged to the ground by Travis Pays and the umpire deciding that Parkin wasn't in possession at that particular time so Parkin has the free kick. Back to the centre wing it goes on the outer side. Bonnie in the thick of things for the Saints. A 30-yard handball goes towards Moran on the centre wing who had a bad attack on the fumbles earlier in this first quarter and on this occasion he takes the ball across the boundary line centre wing, outer side Minos and Scott contesting the ball going down towards Pays Pays in the centre wing, left foot screw kick back towards the half forward line and the whistle on play, umpire Shields awarding the free kick to Alan Davis Davis wasting no time, punt kick on its way down towards full forward towards Dickrich Dickrich being held by one hand, almost marked it one handed, play goes on, it's taken away by Hawthorne now, out towards the half back line, bouncing in open territory Rice will be first to it for the Hawks in the half back line he fumbles and he's counted it across the boundary line a lot of players, very nervous and uh, having 
attacks of the fumbles. First time I've seen Carl Dittrich appealing for free kick when Hawkins had hold of him. Boundary thrown in right over the back went uh, Hayes. Hayes interfering with Don Scott and Scott has the free kick. It's 8-6, to six. Hawthorne with a two-point lead at the ten-minute mark of this first quarter. The kick goes towards Martello, couldn't quite collect the mark, but recovers well. Long kick on its way now towards Hudson, but Hudson trips and Murray comes out to meet it, and in turn is thumped by Kevin Heath. Play goes on. Hudson's flattened to the ground by Cowboy Neal, and will get the free kick. And Bob Murray in real trouble now. Yes, Murray's in trouble, and Hudson's not very uh, healthy either, Roy. He's sitting on the ground. Les being... Hawkins still limping very badly for Hawthorne, so one player of each team in trouble at the moment. I'm watching Les Hawkins. It's not his uh, hamstring that's gone. It appears to be his right ankle. Let's have a look at Hudson, too. He's very groggy indeed. He was sandwiched between two St Kilda players. Cowboy Neal went right over the bat, and Hudson looks very groggy indeed as he walks back. Still, he's walking OK. There's no... Uh, injury, apart from the fact that uh, that knock has certainly uh, dimmed his senses for the moment, but he'll recover. Opportunity for his second goal. He has won 48 for the year. Only needs two to equal Bob Pratt's long-standing record. Hudson moving in, 40 yards out. Punk kick on its way, right across the face of goals. Will not score. In the forward pocket, a big pack of players. Heath appealing for the mark. Umpire Shields calling play on. Taken away by Judson. Out towards the centre wing, and Bremner takes a beautiful mark. Hawken going off for Hawthorne. Ken Beck getting ready. Bremner on the centre wing, outer side. Taking plenty of time. Long kick is on its way. Right to the goal square it goes. Hudson sets himself. Couldn't mark the ball off. Hands it goes out towards the back pocket, close to the boundary line, and over it goes. Murray's going off the ground. Kelvin Moore drives it down towards centre wing. A chance for uh, Day to take it off the hands of the pack. He drives it up towards Heath. And Heath flies, has it punched away by uh, a Big Cowboy Neil. It comes to uh, Ma. He trips over at the psychological moment, but it's picked up by Heath. Driven up towards uh, the 10 yard square. Up goes uh, Big uh, Lawrence. It was Lawrence, but it's picked up the hands of the pack by Matthews. Driven up towards full forward. A chance there for Hudson, but he's bundled out of the way. Kicked off the ground by uh, Lawrence. Out towards the half-back flank. Rice and Manzi there. Rice was being held. Manzi gets to the ball first. Swings around onto his left foot and sends a delightful pass to Travis Pays. Good play, St Kilda. They got that ball away from that Hawthorne goal line. Galt is quickly. warming up for St Kilda. Galt is warming up. Pays drives it towards centre half forward. Up flies Breen. Can't take it. Big go. Uh, Norm Bustle is there, gets the ball across to Mar. Mar is interfered with, and it, that's uh, the mark is taken by uh, by Park and the Hawthorne captain, and he gets the free kick for in the back. He drives it now up towards centre wing, flying as Martello can't take it. Picked up by Angus, driven up towards half forward. Up flies Matthews, and a good mark to Matthews, all over Judson. Good strong mark, all the way. Quick hand pass to Crimmins. Crimmins is now 35 yards out. Is grabbed quickly, drives it up towards Hudson, but it's offline. And out of play. Free it kick to Crimmins, I think, uh, Thorold. Free kick after Crimmins had kicked it. A penalty kick down the ground to the most dangerous man on the field, Peter Hudson. In the forward pocket. Right near the right hand behind post. In fact, umpire Shields is lining up Hudson right on the boundary line. Now we'll see what Peter Hudson can do from this very awkward position. Umpire Hudson has been called over to the boundary line. <laughs> umpire Hudson, Umpire Shields has been called over by Hudson New to the boundary to line because of the blowing streamers in his path. Trying to crib a few extra yards, Peter Hudson. Up he comes. Reverse punt kick on its way across the face of goal, out of bounds on the full. And listen to that St Kilda crowd. Bob Murray arguing with the club doctor, but I think the club doctor's going to win. One goal, two, eight, Hawthorne to one clear goal. St Kilda, 15 minutes of the quarter gone as Cowboy Neal will put the ball into play from that out of bounds on the full by Hudson. A lovely torpedo by Cowboy Neal, deep to the northern stand, half-back flanks. Beck flies, can't take it, knocked out of the pack by Minot, across to Elliott. Elliott breaks clear now with a kick up towards centre-half forward and Breen judges it beautifully, has the run on Bustle. He's running away from Bustle, but uh, panic sets in by Breen and his kick goes astray. When he had ample room to take another two bounces, he kicked quickly while off balance, and the kick marked by Scott in the back pocket. Scott drives it up towards Day, and a good strong mark by Day, half-back flank in front of a member stand. He plays on quickly, gets it across ground towards centre of the field. A chance there for Ma to come through the pack. He does so, so does Angus. Angus taps it on, has great courage, Angus, and it's up to Hawthorne's full forward zone. Hudson bumps his opponent out, um, 
Lawrence, but it's Lawrence equal to the task as he is held when not in possession and he'll take the free kick. A good individual tussle between Peter Hudson and uh, Barry Lawrence. Incidentally, Thorold, Bob Murray is resting in the forward pockets and Kilda hoping, of course, that uh, a lot of running around will warm up that uh, the injury or the strain that he suffered in the first couple of minutes. Lawrence boots it up towards half-back flank. A chance for Rice, but in comes Manzi. Kicks it off the ground. Has the ball in front of him. Picks it up nicely. Beautiful. Eventually tackle, uh, eventually hand passes it across to Theodore. Theodore's gone. Oh, got rid of it just in time. It goes to Bonnie. Bonnie, a quick hand pass towards Murray. Murray in the pocket, gets it across to Manzi. Manzi lines it up oh. and kicks it out of bounds on the full, right across the face of goal. And a golden opportunity gone begging for some kill luck as they remain on one goal and Hawthorne one goal too. What a sensational opening to this grand final. Well, Les Hawkins going off the ground in the first six minutes and Bob Murray in trouble. The St Kilda star back when in trouble. Anyway, it's going, it's a mark to Stuart Tross on the left half forward flank on the outer side of the ground. St Kilda kicking towards the scoreboard or town end. They trail by two points at the moment. And Stuart Trott coming in, a good kick of the football. Taking plenty of time. The player's dropping back in the 10 yard square, but he should get the distance all right. It's uh, screwing. Oh, it's going to be close. It's going to be very close. He's put it through. And there's a goal to St Kilda, kicked by their wingman, Stuart Trott. And the Saints have hit the front. St Kilda, two straight goals. Hawthorne, 1-2 at the 17-minute mark in the first quarter. I think it just proves just how tricky that wind is out there, Peter, because that swung perceptibly. On ABC Radio and ABC Grandstand Digital, this is Vintage Grandstand. Davis on the left half forward flank, a long way out from goal. Right in front of Bay 19 and 15 yards going against Hawthorne. And this will bring Davis to within about 65 yards from goal. After giving away the free kick, Peter, uh, Matthews gave Alan Davis, let's say, a friendly pat on the head later, which is the reason for the 15-yard penalty. Kick by Davis, one makes the distance, going to drop short. And Heath in front of the pack takes a good saving mark in defence for the Hawks. St Kilda, two goals. Yeah. Hawthorne, yeah. one goal, two. So the Saints lead by four points in the 1971 Grand Final. Heath plays the member side. Up they go. Punched away. A chance here for Porter. In comes Ma. Gets a short kick. Up towards the wing. They set themselves here. Crimmins is, uh, yes, the free kick is going. Hawthorne's way. Interference against Judson. And the free kick taken by Crimmins on the wing on the member side. He swings the ball square. In towards centre half forward. Hudson in front. Nearly takes the mark. Punched away just slightly by Lawrence. Enough to deflect it. Picked up by Bob Kenny. Kenny a short one into Hudson. Hudson oh. takes a one-hander. 25 yards out. On about a 25 to 30 degree angle. It was a beautiful pass by Kenny. Magnificent understanding between these two players. Kenny and Hudson. Hudson coming in now for goal number two, maybe, and maybe goal 149 for the year. Hudson coming in now. He's lined it up. Oh, it's offline, right across the face of goal, and out of bounds on the full, and that's the second time it's happened in this match. From Although exactly he the same made position. A magnificent goal by Hudson in the opening minutes of the game from about 65 yards out on the boundary line, and the two shots since have been a little easier, and he's put them both out of bounds on the full. The kick out by St Kilda from that free kick out to the half-back line on the outer side. Players throwing themselves in at the moment. Picked up by Scott, who's played a great game so far. A high kick by Scott. Going to land in the uh, forward pocket. Punched away by the St Kilda defence. And there'll be throw in in that position. Twenty and a half minutes gone in the first quarter. Two goals, 12 points to St Kilda and Hawthorne, one goal, two, a total of eight, so the Saints have a four-point lead. Norman Bussell now in the half-back line to clear for Hawthorne. To the centre wing it goes, and the mark is taken by Rice. Rice's tick is smothered, it goes towards Ross Smith who fumbles. Oof. Centre wing out of side, Don Scott gets booted to the ball in towards full forward. Nobody able to mark it, behind the back the opportunity for Matthews, if he can pick the ball up. St Kilda's defence pressurising Matthews, eventually gets booted to it in towards the goal, where it goes. Lawrence's front position on Hudson, and Lawrence wins out. Hudson to the ground, and Lawrence racing away as he second bounds towards the half-back line. Now boots and killed it in towards the centre. Great play, Lawrence. Beautiful kick finds Elliott. Great play. Elliott to boot the Saints into attack. Towards the half-forward line it goes, looking for Davis. He's got front position, well knocked away by Moore. Great defensive play, and the boundary throw-in is the result. Half-forward line for St Kilda. Members side. 23 minutes of play in this first quarter. A forward line for the Saints. Parkin can't break clear of the day's uh, short kick goes towards the centre wing. Ma in possession and a hurried kick by Ma towards the centre wing, but the mark is taken by Basenko. The Saints to bounce back into attack. 
Make rain still falling at the Northern Cricket Ground as Basenko boots towards the half forward line. Scott up high, then thumps the ball to ground. It's taken by Breen, snapshot by Breen in towards full forward. Murray can't. Uh, now he's collecting pace, but Stevenson coming in to tackle Bob Murray. Murray in the forward pocket and heaps of trouble. He may get a free kick. He will. Two off on players against Murray, and Murray, who's versed on one leg, refused to give in, and Bob Murray has won out. From full back, the opportunity to boot St Kilda's third goal. Well, he's no stranger, of course, because he played most of his football in the association at centre half forward for Sandringham. Murray moving in, distance no worry, very acute angle, punt kick on its way. One point. St Kilda 2-1, 13, Hawthorne 1 2 8. A comment from Roy Wright. Well, it's very, very vigorous and a very fast opening in this quarter. Uh, players going down by nine pins, no one shirking the issue, and certainly it's going to be a test of stamina, I feel, as the game progresses. Matthews drives a punt kick now down over the centre towards centre half forward. From behind, it's Cowboy Neal who just doesn't uh, get paid the mark. In there is Stevenson. He gets pulled and shoved and he'll take the free kick. Plays on quickly. Up towards Hudson it goes. Hudson and... Uh, uh, Hudson wins out on this occasion, has the chance now to drive it in towards the 10-yard square, and a long kick it is, and oh, it's through for his second goal. It's a miraculous kick by Hudson, and a beautiful piece of football. 149 to Hudson. Two goals to Peter Hudson. Hawthorne moved to 2-2, 14. Go to the lead again now from St Kilda, 2-1, 13. 26 and a half minutes of play, first term, grand final, 1971. Well, I suppose that's the old story of having a specialist in a position because Hudson's two goals have been absolutely superb. The red light rain falling here at the MCG. It's been falling for about 40 minutes and the uh, surface is getting a little slippery at the moment and the ball will probably get even uh, harder to handle. From that uh, throw in, it's a scrambly play at the moment. Eventually, Stevenson, his kick is rebounded. It goes to Matthews. Matthews gets a clear kick up towards the half-forward line. Heath going up. He can't mark the ball. A chance here for St Kilda. They're trying to get the ball away. Oh, there's uh, Heath is fell behind the play by Colling. But I think it could have been staged a little bit because he wasn't very long in getting up. And he appears all right at the moment. The ball has gone out of bounds on Hawthorne's left half forward flank. Minot going up and the ruck interference against uh, Martello. And the big boy, Forston Kilda, will take the free kick on little, the halfback line. A little bit too experienced, Minot. Took the front position and let um, the, his opponent do all the pushing. Hawthorne 2 2 14. St Kilda 2 1 13. Torpedo punt by Minot. Up to the half forward line. Beck goes up. Can't hold the mark. It goes to Dittrick through sheer strength. He gets his kick up towards Bonnie. A chance here for Davis. He shepherds David Parkin. Oh, players going in every direction at the moment. And the free kick is going to Hawthorne against Davis for using the elbow. Well, uh, both those players, Parkin and Davis, met uh, very heavily, but apparently the tackle or the. Uh, way that uh, Davis came in wasn't suitable to umpire Shields. The kick by Parkin, punch further afield by Martello. Keddie gets one in the back, could have been foxing a little bit. The ball very close to the boundary line. In fact, it's only about a foot away. The players jostling for it against Mara Fawthorne and the free kick will go to Gary Colling on the wing on the member's side, right in front of our broadcasting point here at the MCG. Alan Jeans on the coach's bench. Uh, directing traffic down there from St Kilda's point of view. Kick by Colling up to the half forward line. The ball goes right through the pack. A chance here for Scott. He gets a, a short kick up towards Manzi. Manzi comes to it. And that's the end of the first quarter here in the grand final at the MCG. Only one point to the difference. Hawthorne 2 2 14. St Kilda 2 1 13. Both of Hawthorne's goals kicked by Peter Hudson and St Kilda's goals coming from Trot and Theodore. This is Vintage Grandstand on ABC Radio and ABC Grandstand Digital. First quarter highlights there from the 1971 grand final between Hawthorne and St Kilda. Alistair Nicholson, Matt Clinch and Mark McClure with you. Replaying the game and chatting to a couple of the key players. We've already heard from David Park and later on Don Scott, Barry Breen and Peter Hudson. But the man who had one of the, the last touches of that opening term has joined us. Former Saints defender Gary Colling is on the line. G'day, Gary. Uh, good afternoon, guys. How are you? Great to have you with us. Thanks for your time today. Uh, we were talking to um, David Parkin earlier about just how physical this game was. So much happening in that first quarter of football. Only a point the margin with just the four goals kicked in us. What are your memories of, of that day back in 1971? <laughs> 
Uh, not very good. Not very fond. <laughs> trying to push it to the back of my mind. That, in actual fact, I've never watched the game, and that is the only um, or vision or sound I've actually uh, heard in uh, 50 years of it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, not not uh, very good memories. But you know, talking about the physicality, I mean, a Hawthorne and St Kilda, it was uh, it was sort of deemed a bit of a uh, uh, bit of a blight if you ever used an elbow. Um, both coaches, I think, you, you, you just had to go full bore. It, it had to be fair and uh, knock the living uh, bejesus out of each other, but as fair and as hard as you could. How old were you then, Cat? Uh, 21, yeah, 21, Sellers, yeah. 21. What's, what was the feeling like, though? You must remember that when you first walked out. Oh, yeah, look, to uh, to play. Like, people often say, you know, you hear the roar, and, and you would know, but... I, I don't think it, my feet even touched the ground. It was just every well, every every time you did, you'd hear a roar, but in between, you heard nothing. It was you were just sort of concentrating, and um, yeah, I, I don't think the uh, the weather helped either. So uh, anyway, you, you had a big uh, job on Bobby Kitty. Well, I'm I'm trying to actually think whether I'd ever played on uh, Bob before, but um, oh, look up until three quarter time, and I've always sort of pride on myself. And in those days, the defenders, you always went out and. All you were told to do was stop him from uh, getting a kick. Uh, don't worry about your own stats. And uh, um, I could, most times, I would be able to uh, tell you what my opponent had, where they got him virtually. But uh, that game, uh, as I've said, I've repressed it completely from my memory. <laughs> but I do, people have told me only had a handful of uh, possessions up to three quarter time. So. Yeah, he did. Uh, he, he was did. moved to full forward, and, and Peter Hudson, uh, who'd been knocked senseless in the first quarter, like Cowboy Neil had had been moved to, to set a half forward. Um, in terms of, of the nature of the contests in those days, Gary, what what was the style of play that uh, an Alan Jeans was encouraging you to, to go with? Oh, look, it was just, um, you know, don't worry, don't, it was more limiting the opposition. So as defenders, you know, that was our task. And you, you talk about the, I'd never played full back before. And I and Hawthorne had this, well, they invented Pagan's Paddock yonks before um, Pagan and uh, you know Hutto was one out most of the time and I can remember going there and I'm thinking oh you know the runner come, will come out and tell me to you know, go back to the halfback flank and I can remember looking up thinking oh geez the MCG's got a fair amount of camber um, <laughs> <laughs> I was right back in the goal square I, I, I don't think I could see anyone or sort of you know as as a back you want uh, you want to close down the space and as a forward you want all the space in the world Believe me, there was plenty there, and uh, but I thought, oh no, they'll, they'll move me. Um, it took took them three goals before they did. Cat, is that one that's got away from you guys? Because you were well in front, twenty-seven points with five minutes to go in the third quarter. Yeah, I, yeah, for sure, um, for sure. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't, you know, you, whether you're relaxed um, mentally, uh, who knows? But I, I doubt it. They, they, they just got that run, run on, and um, you know, it was, it was straight out of the centre, bang down. Um, over centre forwards in, into that open space, and they played that game brilliantly. I suppose the other thing too is, um, you know, one of one of the things that comes out of you. I look at uh, Kitty. Well, he used to always analyse the game, and mm. they were doing all the commando stuff in those days, and we weren't really into the physicality. And uh, like he was a, a lot stronger, body on body, and in those days you just played one one on one, man on man. No zoning off, and you know the biggest lesson that I got from that. And uh, even when I went coaching, I never, uh, if a bloke beat you, or that's what I used to say to the backs, don't don't get tighter and tighter, which is what we were told to do. Zone off, don't, and don't worry about your man as much. Stop the ball coming in, and that's that was a sort of a trap. I think um, a lot of our a lot of us backmen got into in those days. Gary, it's Matt Clinch here. You went on to captain the Saints. Um, can you tell our listeners what sort of captain Ross Smith was like? Oh, Smith, Smithy was uh, just brilliant. Like he was always, uh, always encouraging, always led by example. I mean, he just put his head down and uh, his little bum and uh, he'd get knocked over and <laughs> you'd think, how in the hell would he survive that? But he, he got up with you every time. I, I seriously can't recall him being knocked out at all. Yeah, that right. was amazing. Mm. It was one of the few that day, I reckon, Gary. <laughs> was it fact yeah. or fiction that Alan Joyce, or was there any communication before the game about, uh, sorry, Alan Jeans about targeting Peter Hudson? Yeah, there was a, 
It was a comment about Hudson so. making his 150 and Cowboy piped up and he said, well, he can't do it if he's uh, unconscious. <laughs> uh, and that was that was in the pre-match address. So, uh, yeah, and true to his word. Gee whiz, he had a pretty star-studded side too. Bit of talent there as well. Yeah, there was. And, uh, you know, we should have won a hell of a lot more games. And I blame you, Sellers. Like, we could never give out a get over Carlton. No matter whether we played your first semi or prelim final, Carlton always seemed to have the wood on us. And, and yet we were you know, probably destined for a lot more finals, uh, well, winning finals we did. But it was Carlton were our nemesis at the time. You got a good close-up view of Barry Lawrence, uh, who'd been moved on to Peter Hudson early in the game when Bob Murray was injured when he injured his, his knee. Gary, what, what are your memories of Barry Lawrence's performance that day and more broadly him as a player? One of the dirtiest players I'd, I'd <laughs> ever played with. Um, I used to shake my head um, at some of the things he got, got away with. But his excuse was, well, when Hudson left Tasmania... I was the targeted player, and uh, now it's my time to uh, to give it back. What did he get away with? Anything, Everything. Anything oh, spring to mind? <laughs> I, I think one of the classics was that uh, if someone went to pick up the ball, it, he'd stand over the over the player, stand over the ball. As soon as the black guy had put his hands on the uh, footy, W just you know raked the boot down the uh, guy's fingers. But he was just he um, he was probably five ten, five eleven, just beautifully built and just waited like a stealth line and uh, anyone any gap he just dropped the shoulder bang yeah, he's he pretty was rugged bloke great. but a very good man oh yeah oh, great player well, i mean he was rated as the uh second hudson in uh in tassie well you'll be happy to hear you <laughs> talking about him like this <laughs> how'd you get the nickname well, cat gary um, oh, oh. I oh. think it was on my first footy trip uh, okay. over in Adelaide. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't find my way home, uh, and they'd gone for a run or something in the morning. And uh, Travis Bays had the the knack of uh, nicknaming everyone, and apparently I was just curled up on a park bench and uh, <laughs> just got there. But uh, yeah, totally on your own. No idea where I was. On your own. <laughs> I'm own, yes. Now, now you, went, um, you mentioned that you got into coaching, Gary, after you finished your playing career. Um, you coached the reserves at St Kilda. You worked as the, the footy manager there as well. So you ended up working with, with Peter Hudson down the track. Yes, and look, it's, it's quite funny. I'm, well, not quite funny. Like, no one, look, I knew I cost the game, but no one mentioned it at all. So, like, it's, it's only in the last year. And I've, uh, Don Scott and I are quite good friends. And uh, uh, had I never mentioned it, <laughs> not, not once, uh, while I worked with him. Um, but a couple of years ago, Don and I, you know, we're down on the Mornington Peninsula, went to the local footy. And Don said, oh, he, he went and got some coffees. Next minute, I've got uh, Bob Kelly beside me. <laughs> and uh, he, he just said something, you know, and then next thing he said, Gene should have moved here a lot earlier. <laughs> I said, Bob, I don't want to go there. Like, but uh, for the next 10 minutes, I copped it off Bob. And then, you know, it seemed like an eternity. Don finally uh, returned with the coffees. And I said, uh, thanks very much. Anyway, he just laughed his head off. But then <laughs> yeah. we just had a reunion with um, uh, with Cowboy. So he's suffering a little bit of uh, yeah. dementia. And it's the only time ever a St Kilda player has uh, mentioned it. And I wish they would have out of earlier. But Bruni... Someone said um, something about, what? how did you lose it? It might have been Mike Sheen was there, and he said, oh, how did you lose it? And he just pointed to me, and he said, that prick there cost us the game. Oh. <laughs> what, the point kicker did so, that? Sorry, the point kicker, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, he said what everyone had been thinking for the last 50-odd years. But do you ge- genuinely believe that, Gary, that, that you cost and killed of the no. game that day? Because there were all sorts of factors that would have gone into Hawthorne's comeback oh, that day, not necessarily just Bob Keddie's goals in the last quarter. Oh, look, I, I, well, I, I, I personally did uh, show a lot of responsibility. I don't think I was sober for the next three days trying to bury my head. But, uh, oh, yeah, look, I, it's funny because I do, uh, I did pride myself um, on not letting blacks get kicks and probably to my detriment in a lot of cases because, as I said earlier, you forget um, you forget about uh, playing your own natural game. Because mm, I was mm. well, never a backman. I was always a forward. So. Yeah, yeah. And in a game, you know, it was, yes, Mr. Jeans, no, Mr. Jones. <laughs> that was the way of the times. Six foot high and 
I'll play in the back pocket. I'll play wherever I can to, to get a game. Gary, thanks for taking a trip down memory lane. Um, we're about to relive a bit more on Grandstand. Okay, no worries, guys. Thanks very much. See you, guys. This is ABC News with David Rowlands. Australians have marked the 105th anniversary of Anzac Day in lounge rooms and on front verandas and driveways in place of the usual dawn services. Just a handful of leaders and veterans were at the National War Memorial this morning while the rest of the country listened to the last post from home. Prime Minister Scott Morrison acknowledged the challenges of changing long-held traditions and reflected on his own family's experiences of war. I can hear the sound of the races being called on the radio as my pop Sandy sat in the afternoon sun on his balcony and I remember the quiet pain of war he endured and worked so hard to hide from a young boy. In New South Wales, people have marked Anzac Day by holding dawn services from isolation in their homes. Michelle Brown has the story. People have embraced the Light Up the Dawn initiative devised by the RSL to ensure people could still be part of Anzac Day despite the cancellation of public events. Social media is being flooded with photographs of people lighting candles and taking part in dawn services broadcast across the country from the front of their homes. Hannah from Sydney was one of those who took part. I was up on the driveway with my dad holding the candles and it was a very sort of respectful ceremony. RSL acting President Ray James says in an unexpected way, isolation due to the coronavirus may even have increased participation. Adelaide resident Margaret Townsend decorated her front yard with poppies and banners to try and commemorate this special day. And this was my way of sort of um, letting people know that if they wanted to just pass by and stop for a minute and have a look and see, it might also allow them to have that feeling of what it all means. The Tasmanian Premier Peter Gutwin has extended his sympathies to the family and friends of a 90-year-old man who has died from coronavirus. The man from the state's northwest passed away yesterday after being cared for at the Mersey Community Hospital at La Trobe. It's the 10th coronavirus death in Tasmania. Premier Gutwin says his thoughts are with the man's loved ones. On behalf of the Tasmanian government, uh, I'd like to uh, extend my condolences uh, and deep sorrow to the family of the 10th uh, victim to coronavirus, a 90-year-old man uh, who was being cared for on the northwest coast. Health authorities in Queensland are attempting to contact passengers who flew on flight VA341 for Melbourne to Brisbane on Monday after a person on that flight tested positive for COVID-19. Their efforts come as the state records just two new cases of coronavirus today. Four new infections at a nursing home in Sydney's west are among a dozen extra COVID-19 cases reported in New South Wales today. Two residents and two staff members at Anglicare's Newmarch House tested positive in the last 24 hours. Meantime, the Victorian government says there's been three new cases of coronavirus diagnosed in the state overnight. And Western Australia has recorded one new case of COVID-19, bringing the state's tally to 549. The new case is a 65-year-old woman from Perth and is linked to the Costa Luminosa cruise ship. A Sydney man has been charged with assault after allegedly spitting at a ferry worker at Circular Quay. Police say the 44-year-old man's saliva hit the worker on the chest and neck. The man was arrested at Bass Hill Police Station in the southwest yesterday. US Democrat House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has sharply criticised comments by President Donald Trump over disinfectant and the coronavirus. Mr Trump has faced widespread criticism from doctors and medical officials over his suggestion that disinfectant could be injected or taken orally to fight COVID-19. He now says he spoke sarcastically and that his remarks were taken out of context. Ms Pelosi says clearly and sadly, Mr Trump isn't listening to medical experts. It's a clear, visible, within 24 hours, of how the Republicans reject science and reject governance. Without science in our decision-making, we are not going to be on a very successful path. China has dispatched a medical team to North Korea after a US media report that leader Kim Jong-un was struggling to recover from surgery. Here's China correspondent Bill Bertels. 
Multiple sources have confirmed to the news agency Reuters that a team, including medical experts, was sent from China on Thursday. China's government hasn't publicly rebuffed the reports. Earlier this week, CNN reported that Kim Jong-un was in a delicate state after surgery. The US President Donald Trump rejected that, and South Korean reports have since claimed Mr Kim's been spotted back at work inspecting projects in the coastal city of Wonsan. ABC News. Nice bit of shepherding by Frame Bart. Goal. It's a goal. No. Yes, it is. Pooped in towards goal. We've got Hudson. Centering kick for Brownless. Sets himself. Ablitz. Ablitz marked it. You watch the fight, Doug. I'll watch the footy. Look at Left foot. Look at that big pack of players. Great mark to Royce Hart. Compton picks up the ball, slams it, goal, and puts it through. Sheldon picks it up. Bundy not open, goal. There, Shimmel Bush and Bremner. In comes Egan Knight. Takes the magnificent mark right over the top. On ABC Radio and ABC Grandstand Digital. A little fire. This is Vintage Grandstand. Lovely to have your company on this Vintage Grandstand as we look back on the 1971 Grand Final between Hawthorne and St Kilda. Coming up shortly, Don Scott, Barry Breen and Peter Hudson were at quarter time with the Hawks leading by a point, 2-2-14 to the Saints, 2-1-13. Let's pick up the action in the second quarter. Only time will tell whether Murray has uh, shrugged off that injury. From the centre bounce, it goes out towards Stuart Trott on the centre wing. He's thumped to the ground as his kick goes high in the air towards the centre wing. Theodore up high, couldn't mark it. Bustle runs into trouble. Handball goes a couple of yards and Ross Smith burrowing in there for the Saints. Tries to get it out towards Carl Dittrich. Dittrich on the centre wing, pushed and shoved and Dittrich will take the free kick. Umpire Shields indicating he was tripped. Dittrich, not a long kick towards uh, Minot. And Minot has the mark and just missed something from Don Scott, which had five knuckles. (laughs) <laughs> Minot on the centre wing to boot the Saints into attack a wobbly old kick towards the full forward line and Heath's there for Hawthorne Heath breaking up that attack back towards the centre of the ground two St Kilda players here Manzi waiting over the back showed shrewd judgement but then couldn't collect the ball on the centre of the ground and Rice will take the free kick Rice to boot uh, Hawthorne into attack the Hawks have a two point lead 14 to 13 a one point lead rather Rice's kick towards the half-forward line. Martello is front position. Hudson over the back. Nobody able to mark it. About 40 yards out from Hawthorne's goal. A big pack of players developing. Umpire Shields calling for a bounce. Only 30 to 35 yards out from Hawthorne's goal. Minot getting the tap down. But it's a dangerous one. It goes straight to Crimmins. And Crimmins has banged it through. Well, Minot's tap couldn't have been more perfect for Peter Crimmins. Went straight onto his chest. And Crimmins, who had a couple of yards to spare on an East and Kilda player, was able to steady down and from 15 yards out bang it through. Roy Wright's your opinion of that ruck uh, piece of work from Minot? Well, it was the cardinal sin of ruck work because he hit it back towards his opposition goal. And Hawthorne's lead is now seven points. 3-2-20 and St Kilda 2-1-13. Ball on the centre of the ground. Opportunity for Barry Breen. Beautifully turns out of trouble. On the centre of the ground, booting St Kilda into attack towards full forward it goes. Over the back, Moore's got front position. It's racing in towards a behind. So the difference is six points. Three goals, two to Hawthorne. Two goals, two to St Kilda. We've had two minutes of play in the second quarter. Rain still falling. Kelvin Moore favouring the members' side out towards the half-back flank. Scott's got front position. Knocked away by Marnot, but nobody there roving the pack for the Saints. Only Bremner for Hawthorne. He's kicking towards the centre. Bounces off Basanko's chest. Goes towards Desmar. He's tackled. Play on calls umpire Shields out towards the centre wing on the other side. Ross Smith has the ball taken away from him. And Robert Day breaks up that St Kilda attack and drives Hawthorne from defence into attack towards the half-forward line and the boundary throw-in. Half-forward line, outer side. Three minutes of play in the second quarter. Senko having to contest the ruck knockout with Martello on this occasion. It goes down towards Stevenson. Couldn't do anything effective with it. Now it's with Ma. His kick travels about two yards. Kicked off the ground by Ross Smith in towards the centre. It goes. The only one home's bustle for Hawthorne. He's about to be met by Manzi who kicks the ball away from him very shrewdly. Good play, Manzi. In towards full forward. His kick, but it's not a good kick. David Parkin can't mark it. Bonnie's out there dueling with Parkin. Very close to the boundary line. Parkin uh, goes to the ground and Bonnie also. Davis now diving on the ball. It's still in play. Davis uh, trying to keep it in play now, but he's put it over the line. And so a boundary throw in. Half forward line for St Kilda out of side. Boundary throw in the forward pocket. Dolan Don Scott gets over the top of Dietrich and Dietrich will take the free kick. Dietrich very cleverly won the front position and Scott trying to reach over had one hand on his shoulder 
as Dietrich with a lovely drop punt kick on its way. It's across the face of goal and through for one behind. It was a very penetrating kick by Dietrich, but just going across the face. So St Kilda moved to 2 3, Hawthorne 3 2. Five points the difference in Hawthorne's favour as Moore elects to go to the northern stand side again. Uh, almost a mark to Bremner, but it's picked up eventually by Pays, driven up to the forward pocket, tapped down towards Rice. Rice uh, drops the ball on the ground and gets tackled and wins the free kick. Half back flank on the northern stand side. Rice drives it along the members' wing. Martello high, can't take it, but it's picked up by Scott. A wild, windy woof of a kick. And it trickles over the line and out of bounds, centre wing, grandstand side. A lot of bad kicking today, Tharold. And it's very greasy, the rain falling a little heavier than last week, I feel. And it's a similar day. Scott into the back of Minot on this occasion. And the St Kilda boys have woken up to the ruck play. Roy Wright, your comments? Yes, they're taking front position away and uh, Scott's trying to have a lift on them with the arm for the greater part of it and they're paying the penalty. Yes, Scott, up until about two, five minutes ago, had killed them in the ruck, and this kick from Minot has uh, been marked by Ross Smith, half forward, left for St Kilda. A long punt kick by Smith, up towards full forward. It's all Hawthorne here, and Ken Beck takes the mark. Ken Beck, or Moore, is it? We'll wait on umpire Shields. Kelvin Moore has been paid the marking decision in that last line of defence for Hawthorne. Five points the difference in Hawthorne's favour. Five minutes into the second quarter. High drop punt kick pack flies, over the back it goes, in the race for it now, it's Moran in front, hotly pressed by Porter, Moran tries to pick it up but can't, Rice is in there, hooks the ball into play, paddles it on in front of him on the half forward flank, and manages to go over the line with it, and it will be thrown in, centre wing to half forward flank in front of the member stand towards the scoreboard end 20 points to Hawthorne, 15 to St Kilda as we wait for boundary umpire, the boundary umpire to come back to it, and it's Ken Beck and Minot in the ruck. Minot wins the front position, but Beck's holding him. Minot gets the tap down. It goes to Angus. Rice is in there. Gets his way through the pack. Drives it across towards centre half forward. No one there. The race is on in earnest now. Trot and Hudson. Hudson wins out but loses the ball. He's hotly pressed by uh, Lawrence. It goes back to Trot. Trot boots it off the ground. Down towards centre wing now as Day runs to it for Hawthorne. He's winning well in the race to it. Can't handle it well enough before it goes over the line. Out of bounds. Centre wing out of side. Six minutes of play gone and in the second quarter and Hawthorne lead by five points. Big knockdown by Trot goes up towards Bustle. He runs straight into Theodore and the umpire sent it and it's going St Kilda's way to be taken by Stephen Theodore on the wing on the outer side. Very steady rain falling here at the MCG at the moment. You wouldn't call it really heavy but it's very showery. Left foot kick by Theodore up towards centre half forward. Dietrich goes up trying to get the ball forward. It comes to the ground. Players battling hard. Nearly a Hawthorne free kick there. Players throwing themselves in recklessly as the St Kilda players endeavour to get the ball forward. But eventually it's uh, Parkin getting a high kick out towards the half back line. Up goes Hawthorne. They can't mark the ball. St Kilda throw themselves on top of the ball. But Parkin coming through the pack once again, playing a tremendous skipper's game. A short kick, not a good one. Goes to Elliott. He loses possession of the ball. Martello comes through. The ball forced forward for Hawthorne once again. Players battling hard at the moment. Picked up by Porter. Up towards the half forward line. And the mark there taken by Heath. Heath on their left, half forward flank. A drop punt in towards uh, Hudson. Hudson punched away, overruns the ball. In comes Rice, or is it uh, Crimmins? Crimmins, left foot kick. In towards Rice, running into an open goal. He muffs the mark, and the ball being forced towards the pocket, and it's out of bounds, and there'll be a throw in. Well, all Rice had to do was hold that mark. He took it right on the chest, and it bounced right out again. He was only about 12 yards out from goal. Vintage Grandstand on ABC Radio and ABC Grandstand Digital. The pressure is fantastic in this grand final. There's the boundary throw in. Over the back, the tap to Minot. He's really getting on top in the rucks now. Bremner couldn't collect it, and Smith robs it from Bremner. Boots and killed it into attack, but not for long, because Don Scott takes the mark. Scott about 45 to 50 yards out from Hawthorne's defensive goal. Punt kick on its way to the centre wing. Matthews to fly from behind. A beautiful mark to Matthews. Mm. Murray Matthews. going off, I think, uh, Peter. Yes, it looks as if uh, Ray is the player to come on. Matthews' kick in the meantime went to half forward for Hawthorne, but not for uh, very long because Lawrence was in the way. Lawrence from half back to Boots and Kilda out of danger. Not a very good kick, and Manzi collected. He does it beautifully from the centre. St Kilda moving to attack towards full forward it goes. Moore knocking it away from Breen. Out towards the half forward line. Breen in there, thick of things, appealing for a free kick, and he's got it. 
Green a long way up from goal. Bob Murray is off the ground. That move was pretty belated too by coach Alan Jeans because it was pretty obvious that Murray could not uh, run properly. Green now moving in, a long punt kick to the goal square it goes. Nobody able to mark the ball and off hands. It's gone out of bounds for a boundary throw in. Forward pocket for St Kilda. Stephen Ray on the ground for the Saints in place of Murray. Dittrich against Beck. Dittrich trying to grab the ball out of the ruck, which he does, and then loses it in the forward pocket. Dittrich in there trying to shepherd for his little captain and Smith. But the kick rebounds from Ralph Smith and another boundary throw in. Forward pocket for St Kilda, and they trail 20-16. to 16. Their deficit is four points. Dittrich again in the ruck getting the tap down. Out towards the centre-half forward position it goes to Theodore. Handball by Theodore to Manzi. Step shot by Manzi is a goal. The Saints have hit the front. At the 21 minute mark of the second quarter, St Kilda back in front. 3 4 to Hawthorne, 3 2. It's 22 to 20. Roy Wright. Well, I think it's amazing the Hawthorne defence completely crowding up the St Kilda forward line, and that was one that came unstuck for them. But it amazes me how the Hawthorne defence can get back down in time to smother Davis where the St Kilda defence can't with uh, Hudson. From the. Uh Centre bounce, the knock, knockdown went Scott's way. Now it's back with Don Scott. Tackle went not in position. Free kick to Don Scott. Scott wasting no time. Driving Hawthorne into attack towards the half forward line. Hudson front position, but uh, Lawrence uh, playing Hudson very well. Now it's taken away by Judson. His kick towards the centre of the ground, and the mark not paid to Elliott. Opportunity for Minot. He's bundled out of the way, and the free kick will go to Brian Minot. St Kilda 29 free kicks to 24, and Hawthorne 21 marks to St Kilda 13. Minot from centre half back driving the Saints towards the half forward line. It's all Hawthorne there. They all fly and spot each other. Knocked forward now by Matthews. It goes towards Angus in the centre. Angus can't break clear of that big pack of players. Umpire Shields blows the whistle just as Ross Smith was about to break away. And the ball up in the centre. Cowboy Neil and uh, Scott to do battle here. And Neil wins out. Boots the St. The St Kilda side into attack. Towards the half forward line it goes. Breen coming out to meet the ball. Moore pushing and shoving Barry Breen. And Breen will take the free kick. And there's evidence of that front position. It's so That's valuable. The, the old yes. story. Breen a long kick of the ball too. He'd be uh, all of 60 yards out from goal, but it's not beyond Barry Breen to score for the Saints. St Kilda's lead is two points. Breen sending a long punt kick on its way. Distance is there and accuracy is there also. It's a goal. The Saints have an eight-point lead. St Kilda 4-4, 28. Both on 3-2-20. And Roy, the Saints are doing all the attacking. Yes, doing all the attacking, getting a lot uh, of drive now from their big men, particularly around that centre bounce, and up forward, uh, Breen, great strength, and getting that front position, as are most of the St Kilda forwards now, trying to get in front, because it's obvious that the man in front is going to be looked after by umpire Shields. Roy, the amazing thing, it was 20 minutes uh, of the quarter gone, and only one goal had been scored for the quarter, now St Kilda have got two in the last two or three minutes. As Hawthorne go forward, a chance for Maher, on the half forward flank, he gets the ball up to Hudson, Hudson is pushed in the back, he played it beautifully, he waited till his opponent met him, he turned his back on him and the opponent cannoned into his back and Hudson has the free kick 15 to 20 yards out. This will be goal 150 thorough if he is uh, successful. Roy, your comments on the astuteness of Peter Hudson then? Well, we all know Hudson used his body absolutely to perfection and that was a, a perfect example. He just waited until that absolute split second, just turned his back and obviously must get the free. Peter Hudson lines up for goal 150 for 1971. It's on its way and it's through. 150 goals to Peter Hudson for 1971. His third today. He's equal Bob Pratt's record. Look at all those policemen who immediately jumped to their feet to uh, stop any supporters running onto the ground and stopping play. <laughs> I think it'll be a goal 151 where they'll have to watch out because that's where he'll break the record. And listen to the hand clapping for Peter Hudson mainly from the member stand back with umpire shields Hawthorne 4-2 St Kilda 4-4 two points in St Kilda's favour as Rice sends the ball half forward again up flies Hudson it's over the back taken by Colling of uh, St Kilda he drives it wide to the outer half uh, back flank Racing to it there is Ma. He manages to get it. Hooks it back towards uh, Keddy. Keddy has it now in the forward pocket. Runs into trouble. Tries to get it to Ma. Does eventually. Ma has it in the forward pocket. Can't pick it up. Is grabbed by the leg. But uh, Smith comes in. Gets it back to Dittrich. Dittrich now has it on half-back flank. With a long kick, Dittrich kicks it over the centre of the field and finds Bonnie in that uh, centre position. 
Bonnie quickly onto the left foot down towards Breen and a beautiful pass and a beautiful lead from the St Kilda full forward and the Saints have Breen at full forward Breen out at centre half forward with this kick he's a long kick of the ball it's a lovely torpedo punt kick but swinging off line and it's through for one point so the Saints go to a three-point lead now, 4-5-29, Hawthorne 4-2-26, 26 minutes of play gone in this second term. And pace still not slackening, the pace still on in the game. Norm Bustle kicking out for Hawthorne, obviously followed Breen down. High, long kick by Bustle, covering about 65 yards, a beautiful kick, it goes right over the back of the pack, interference against St Kilda, and will go Hawthorne's way to Don Scott. That's an enormous kick by uh, by Bustle. One of the longest kicks I've seen him kick. Scotty's 12th, 12th kick coming up now. Uh, wobbly old kick to up towards the half forward lines. Uh, Trot has the chance, but he uh, muffs it. Just pushed in the back. I thought he played foot. The umpire said play on. He had the front position though. Players coming to it now. Very close to the boundary line. It's uh, Desmar paddling the ball along. The chance here for Matthews. Oh, it's slippery over near those practice wickets. I think on every occasion a player makes an effort to get the ball in that position he slips over and it happened last week as well there'll be a throw in with Hawthorne into attack on their left half forward flank Martello and Minot Minot gets the tap down not a very effective one though players converge on the ball and there's Ross Smith the umpire letting it go on eventually uh, blows the whistle and there'll be a bounce St Kilda 4-5 to Hawthorne 4-2 up they go knocked down by uh, uh, by Minot up towards uh, uh, Angus, he gets the ball out towards Rice Rice a high kick in towards full forward Hudson and Lawrence doing battle Hudson gets one hand to it, can't get it it goes to uh, Matthews, he dummies left foot kick by Matthews, up towards Hudson and Dietrich, Dietrich punches the ball away great defensive football and Crimmins comes in, oars at Rice and it's three for one point only to Hawthorne, kicked by Crimmins I felt that Crimmins went to kick the ball, then stopped and had another shot. I felt if he had have tried the first time, he may have kicked a goal. Yeah, I think there was a smother there, Peter. I think that's why he bumped. St Kilda, 4-5-29. Hawthorne, 4-3-27 in this give-and-take grand final. 28 minutes gone in this second quarter. Lawrence kicking out a long one to the outer side. Flank Dietrich getting the front position. Minor taps it over, but it's uh, no one there of St Kilda momentarily. Rice is there, Angus. Picked up by Scott, a left foot kick up towards the forward pocket. Stevenson goes up and pulls in a beauty for Hawthorne. At two bites of the cherry, a difficult mark by Stevenson. He was a dominant player in the first half of the second semi-final. Faded a little in the second half, but played a very serviceable game all over. This is his fourth kick today. Stevenson... He's about uh, 55 yards out on a 30-degree angle. The drop punt, it's going to be out of bounds on the full, I think. Yes, it is, out of bounds on the full. And the free kick to be taken by Barry Lawrence right in the back pocket. 28 and a half minutes gone in the second quarter. And the Saints leading by 29 points to 27. The Saints have a two-point advantage. A drop punt by Lawrence, again to the outer side flank. Up they go, nearly St Kilda Mark, it comes to the ground, Elliot chips in, picked up by uh, Neil, Neil's kick up towards the centre, Bremner goes up, off the hands of the pack, a chance here for Ray, he's got the front position, a left foot kick by Ray up towards Breen and Bustle, Breen can't take it on the first bite, playing for free kick, his grab, play on says the umpire, gets it out towards Ray, Ray's in the pocket, running into an open goal, and it's going to be very close, nearly a mark to Bonnie, it's been forced through, for one point. Well, Ray had the chance, and I thought Bonnie may mark, but Parkin, very strong down there, and I'm sure that he put Bonnie off balance, and the ball was forced through for one point. Ray could have even run in closer, couldn't he? Yes, he could have. St Kilda 4-6-30, Hawthorne 4-3-27, nearly half-time here in the grand final, and this time Bustle's going to favour the member side flank, it's not a really good kick, up towards Manzi, he has one bite at it, taps it forward goes out towards Bremner, Bremner swings the ball square, up towards centre half back here's a chance for Neil, he gets the ball across to Smith, Smith has grabbed over the shoulder has a shot for goal and it's way off line it's going to land about 10 yards out up they go, but it's good defensive play by Parkin, here's the player who waited down got the ball up towards the half back line against Manzi though, in the back to Scott, and Don Scott will take the free kick on the half back flank Scott out towards the centre wing, John Manzi in trouble too. Looks like a uh, facial injury for Manzi. But in the meantime, Hawthorne through Moore now towards the half forward line. And Martello marks, plays on. Kick by Martello in towards the goals. And it's a minor score. 
Martello in two minds then whether to play on he nearly handball which I think would have been uh, the better thing to do but uh, he decided uh, belatedly to take his kick for goal and he was off balance when he took the kick and it scrubbed through for a point so it's Hawthorne 4-4 four, four, 28 and St Kilda 4 six, 30. 30 minutes of play in the second quarter Lawrence to kick off Low trajectory, not covering a great deal of distance out towards the half back line. Collected by Ma. Ma on the half forward line, then lose it. Back comes back to it again. Handball out towards Crimmins. And eventually the boundary line beats the ball. A boundary throw in. Forward pocket for Hawthorne. And there it is for half time. A fantastic test of strength from the first half of the Melbourne Cricket Ground. And the score at half time in the grand final Hawthorne 4 4 28. Trail St Kilda 4 6. 30. The goals to half-time, Peter Hudson 3, which equals Bob Pratt's long-standing VFL record of 150. And the other goal to Peter Crimmins, for St Kilda, one goal apiece to Trot, Green, Theodore and Manzi. This is Vintage Grandstand. Half-time in the 1971 VFL Grand Final and St Kilda leading Hawthorne by two points. Alistair Nicholson, Mark McClure and Matt Clinch reliving the Grand Final on Vintage Grandstand for you this afternoon. Barry Breen coming up later on and Peter Hudson. But we're now joined on the line by a man who went on to win three premierships with Hawthorne. He played over 300 games. Don Scott's joined us on the line. Welcome, Don. Good morning, afternoon, boys. Great to have you with us. <laughs> Thank you. What are your reflections uh, when you think back to that, that famous game of, of 1971? What, what immediately pops into your head, Don? Well, uh, I suppose it was a premiership. That's the main thing. That's all you look back on. Uh, I suppose a few little things come out of the game that you do remember. It was 50 years ago. It's a long time. But it's great that you people are, uh, you know, um, reliving those games because I think we've, we've lost sight of football and I think we should be honouring the teams, not the individuals. I seem to honour a lot of individuals nowadays and not the team. It is a team sport and uh, and there were, there was a good team every year and that good team usually finished up winning the uh, premiership. What made your team such a, a strong team that year, do you think? Well, it's an interesting team, and this is why in life and in sport especially, I can't understand why there's not, not more success as far as uh, that goes because that team finished out of the... hadn't played in a final series at all. The year before, they finished about eight, and they went through 71, and I think they earned plus the games we played interstate as well. We won about 26 or uh, 24, 23-odd games. The following year, about six of those guys, four of those guys, five or six of them played in the reserve grade premiership. So what I'm trying to use as an example is for one year, one concerted effort, it's amazing what a group of individuals can do. Hey, Donnie, we just had Gary Colling on before and he said you took him to the football one day. And, uh, oh, no. And then uh, <laughs> oh, Bob, Bob Getty turned on. up and you took off and got the coffees <laughs> and left him I, alone with him. What's going on? What sort of, know, what I, sort of person that, are you? Uh, a very, very smart person. <laughs> I knew. As soon as I saw Kenny, I was off. <laughs> I was off. Uh, he'd be telling me about his hole in the heart and every other health complaint he's got. So I thought, there's Cat. I'll leave Cat. <laughs> and, and Cat got in front of the whole half game. Oh, he was almost crying on the, on the, on the phone. Me. When I drove you home, he said, what did you do to me? <laughs> Actually, at three-quarter time, Don, you're in a lot of trouble. In this game, oh, uh, we were gone. Yeah, you're in big trouble. You were 27 points down at the 25 yeah. minute, 20 minute mark of the last quarter. Yeah. Got back to 20 odd points, of round figures, uh, at three quarter time, and and blew them away. What well, uh, you got to take that. You say 20 points is not much, but back then it was a lot because the uh, conditions weren't conducive to good football. It was wet, damp, and uh, the way they got the roll on, and the, you know, in that third quarter, there was just no no way known we could. Well, we did stop them, but it just looked as if they were going to go on with it. Take us into the huddle at three-quarter time um, because we had David Parkin on earlier and he was talking about John Kennedy's speech to the, the team at three-quarter time and then your reaction to it. Can you take us inside that huddle, Don? Well, I suppose Parkin also used the term that the 
game with first half was played without the ball. Did he use that one? <laughs> he told us to say he did. Oh, shit. He's full of shit, isn't he? Oh. Oh, well, anyway, all I can remember, well, yeah, I suppose Kennedy always had a thing if we were in, in a, you know, a losing position at three quarters. Oh, it didn't look like we could win. You always had to fight it out. And um, I, and the way he was talking, I just couldn't believe that he would concede that, you know, we five years earlier, we played off against Fitzroy, who'd finish off on the bottom of the ladder five years earlier. So we'd come from absolutely nowhere to play in a grand final, and and I just thought John Speech was conceding defeat, and uh, I just co- I just couldn't relate to that because we'd trained very hard, we'd put a lot of work in, and uh, we were the best team. We won 19 games that year, uh, and I just couldn't understand why for just half an hour we couldn't just have a a red hot go. I heard that you pulled him up again after after the coach walked away. You said, "Hang on a second, this is not on." Uh, yeah, what did you say? Oh. I'd like Years ago, Mark. Oh, I mean, you'll remember every <laughs> second of it. You know that. There'd be a few expletives in there, and uh, I don't think I could relate it on the ABC. Yeah, but I'll let me let me say what happened at the first bounce. What happened then? You punched it twenty five metres down the ground and kicked the goal. Is that right? Uh, it was only ten metres. Parkin spoken to you again. He's lying, <laughs> is he? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but... Don, yeah. it's Matt Clinch here. Did you feel like there was a moment in the last quarter where the momentum sort of shifted? Could you? Pinpoint a moment? No, we just started. It was funny how it just changed completely. Um, the game, I mean, it, it just... I don't know whether David told you. It was a, those games against St Kilda were very horrible games to play. And um, in, all of, in all my career, I've never not looked forward to playing a game. They were always St Kilda back in that time, and they were just tough, horrible games. And... Uh, it was always a tight contest. They asked for no quarter. We gave none. And we asked for exactly the same. And, uh, yeah, I, I, you couldn't have pictured what or envisaged what was going to happen. We just got a run on. And I think we got a couple of hit outs from the centre. It went our way. And away it went. I do remember Peter Crimmins, uh scooping a Brian Minot. Well, that's what I do remember uh, in the forward pocket. I do remember that incident. And that got us going too. And, yeah, and a few other things. The ball just started to run for us. What was the fashion like back then? Oh. Do you remember what you were wearing, Don? Oh, what? Oh, oh well, seriously. Uh, what were you wearing, Don? Uh, Purple trousers? No, uh, no, safari. Lincoln green safari suit. <laughs> <laughs> you serious? No, I'm serious. I got it made of travellers in Swanson Street. <laughs> you had some other colours, though, too, didn't you? Oh, yeah, floral shirt. I would have had the floral shirt. You had well. the handbag, too. Uh, I did at that stage, you're right. <laughs> I can remember it. I remember yeah. going to the after match and I thought, I used to go on the after match after and have a talk, look at the other blokes and I walk in and I see this bloke in a pair of yellow trousers, a bomber jacket, boots up around his knees, a handbag and I thought, who in the hell is this bloke? <laughs> D. Scott. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> what we do when we're younger, Mark. <laughs> I know, mate, I know. What are you up to now, Don? Obviously, you, you played over 300 games, the three premierships. Um, you had a successful career in the media yourself, and um, so many Hawthorne supporters still so very grateful for the role you played in preventing the merger with Melbourne. Absolutely. What about life now? What's Don Scott doing with himself these days? Well, I've just been out of my jump paddock, and I've just shifted a few jumps. Uh they're show jumps and I'm about to get on a horse and uh, I'll ride him. It's a beautiful afternoon. We've got rain coming a little later. Um, so I'm just locked down. I'd, at this time of year, I'd be in Queensland right now competing in the show, uh, show jumping at the various agricultural shows. Uh, but I'm in lockdown like everybody else. Okay. Equestrian. I did hear that you were doing a bit of work down on the Mornington Peninsula with a couple of other ex-footballers as well. Yes, that's the uh, funny trio. We've got Tony Jewell and Bernie Quinlan. <laughs> Can you add Carrie Colling to that too? <laughs> oh, I think Cat's got heart problems. He, he wouldn't last. <laughs> so you go and do odd jobs around the place, do you? So, you oh, no, we look, I, I look after properties and I've just found it, you know, it's far more enjoyable if you've got to have a little bit of company. I've done it by myself for years and uh, when we get together, it's, in fact, it's probably the best job I've had. And uh, the three of us get together and the time passes. And uh, Yeah, no, we have a good rapport amongst the three of us. Let me tell you, TJ's not happy with his last wages. 
<laughs> yes. I won't tell I won't tell you how much he's getting because his wife might listen in. The taxation <laughs> might get him too. <laughs> what about today's footy, Don? Do you watch much of it? Does it still um capture you the way it used to? I think football mirrors society and society back fifty years ago and even fifty years before me, uh you know, before those times was completely different. Um you know, yeah you just couldn't well what we were not instructed to do, but the innuendo was always there from Kennedy, you just couldn't, these blokes today just couldn't relate to it. Um, they just couldn't relate to it. And uh, as an a- amiable analytic, uh, that's a friend of mine, Ray Wilson, who played in the centre in the, uh, or came on and uh, actually ran through Carl Dittrich, uh, he said it was just like going to war back in those days. Uh, and, you know, you went out there... Fearful of what was going to happen, but you had to cop it and you had to dish it out if you wanted to, uh, yeah, if you wanted to gain the respect of, of your peers and the opposition. Don, great to chat to you. Um, sounds like you're in for an enjoyable afternoon down there on the peninsula, but really appreciate you coming on the line to, to relive the 71 grand final with us. Oh, great. And congratulations on doing it. At, uh, and I hope you do a few other teams too. We absolutely will. It's been a pleasure, Don. Thanks very much. Don Scott there, former Hawthorne, three-time premiership player, played over 300 games and uh, what a superb player he was. That goal he kicks in the last quarter that you'll hear very shortly was absolutely superb. So two points to the margin at halftime in the grand final. St Kilda in front. Let's listen to the third term as heard on the ABC. Well, the start of the third quarter, Mike Porter is on the half-back flank now for Hawthorne. The uh, first tap down goes St Kilda's way, taken by Davis. Davis towards the half-forward line. Bonnie up high, couldn't mark the ball. Comes back to it well, is grabbed very high, and Bonnie will get the free kick. About 45 to 50 yards out from goal. 45-degree angle. The goal here would be invaluable to the Saints. Punt kick by Bonnie. It's close. Was it touched on the line? It wasn't. It's a goal. Hawthorne player almost marked the ball. It was very close to the line, but the goal umpire is there, and it's a goal to the Saints in the first 20 seconds of the third quarter. St Kilda increased their lead to eight points. 5-6-36, and Hawthorne 4-4-28. Very costly mistake then by Bustle. Very high tackle. Back to umpire Shields. Minot and Scott again, and Minot wins again towards Dittrich. Dittrich trying to knock it forward. Elliott boots it towards the half-forward line. Hawthorne's defence now smothering. Umpire Shields allowing play to go on, and Rice drives the Hawks out of danger towards the half-forward line. And Matthews, the opportunity. Handball to Hudson. This could be 151. If he can pick it up, he can't. Good smothering play by Wayne Judson, and he's forced the ball through for a behind. Made up a lot of pace, didn't he? Then a lot of yards, Judson, to get there. Great defensive play. Hudson had 151 coming up for sure then. He had a good break of five or six yards over Judson, but Judson, uh, as Roy mentioned, showed tremendous pace to get to Hudson and smother and force the ball through for a minor score. So Peter Hudson still has only 150 for the year behind the Hawks, so the difference is now 36 to 29. It's a seven-point lead to St Kilda. The kick-off out towards the half-back line. Now it's been forced towards the centre wing to Manzi, who handballs to Pays. Pays to boot towards the half-forward Did line. Did someone down? A Hawthorne player on the ground on the centre wing. In the meantime, Davis back towards the half forward line. Stephen Heath. Heath. Heath's the player prostrate on the ground as St Kilda moving towards the full forward line. Another player's down. Dittrich has gone down now as umpire Shields moves in and he's speaking to Stevenson. And Dittrich is going to win out because he'll get a free kick. Don Scott is remonstrating with Dittrich, pointing the finger. But Big Carl doesn't mind. He's got the free kick. Dittrich would be all of 65 yards out from goal. Kevin Heath is still in the hands of the trainers. Dittrich moving in. Drop punt on its way. It's a beautiful kick by Dietrich. It's knocked away by the Hawthorne defence right on the goal line. Taken by Parkin. Parkin from back pocket out towards half-back flank. It beats the pack. Towards the centre wing it goes. Opportunity now for St Kilda through Judson. His kick towards the half-forward line. In towards the forward pocket. It's taken by Bonnie. Bonnie's handball back towards the full forward line. Dietrich bundles a Hawthorne player out of the way. And umpire Shields interpretation in the back. And the free kick has gone to Stevenson. Davis now with the mark. Davis kicking towards the leads, coming out from full forward, but in front more, and more has been paid the mark. Farrell, did you see the incident? Peter, uh, it was a clash between Kevin Heath and Carl Dittrich, and uh, I didn't actually see what happened, but it was a definite, definite physical clash between those two giants.
and Heath went down. Now it's Hawthorne into attack through uh, Matthews. Matthews in towards full forward and Lawrence on the ground couldn't quite mark it. It's towards Hudson. He can't pick up the ball. Now it's with Angus. Only about 15 yards out from Hawthorne's goal and Cowboy Neal on the goal square. Relieve the pressure for St Kilda. Out towards the half back line and Wilson takes the mark. Ray Wilson on the ground at half time and his first kick coming up. Not within kicking distance. Punt kick on its way to the goal square. Hudson's there. He falls to the ground. Umpire Shields allowing play to go on and it's gone out of bounds for a boundary throw in. Four and a half minutes of play in the third quarter. Hawthorne 4 5, 29. St Kilda 5 6, 36. Lawrence a match for all of Hudson's tricks. Boundary throw in. Tap down by, my, by uh, Beck. Judson's got it. Holding the ball or too high was it? Too high. Judson's free kick as Matthews had him by the back of the jumper but in uh, getting the back of his jumper he grabbed him around the neck first. Judson along the northern stand wing, Scott from behind, so is Heath there, Heath a hand pass across to Stevenson, but it's knocked out by Big Dittrich, and Dittrich is in the centre, streaming down the ground, a shocking punt kick, but it falls right into the arms of Bonnie, off the side of the boot, a long hand pass by Bonnie to Dittrich, met solidly by Wilson, good play Wilson, as uh, in comes Moore, gets it across to the opposite half by back flank, racing to it is Rice, yards ahead of his uh, opponent, slips over at the psychological moment, and Rice Peter will take the free kick. Now it's a free kick further afield, Farrell. There was an infringement down in front of Giles again. <laughs> and there's that slippery cricket pitch area as uh, it, Rice's kick goes a poor one. It goes to Elliot, and Elliot finds Davis in the forward pocket. Well, spl- plenty of spectacular football here in the third quarter in the 1971 Grand Final as Alan Davis lines up for St Kilda's sixth goal. They already lead by seven points, and Davis has put it through for one point. Alan Davis, the player who kicked six valuable goals for St Kilda last week, has his first score on the board now with one behind. Bustle boots it straight down the ground, almost taken by Beck. Wilson is in there with Davis. Davis has handballs it out in front of him. A chance for Bonnie as he weaves his way through the pack, but he's met solidly by two Hawthorne defenders who appeared to meet him with hip and shoulder, but umpire Shields says around the neck. Roy Wright, your comments. Well, once again, Thurl, there's uh, a heap of players around. I thought it was a fair bump, to be perfectly honest. Well, that was my view from here, but uh, in the corner of the press box, as uh, Bonnie Bonnie lines up and he puts it through for St Kilda's sixth goal. That's his second, Thurl. Second in this quarter and second in about three minutes. I'd say the tackle was too high. That takes St Kilda on to 6-7-43, getting that uh, first decisive break over Hawthorne. Hawthorne 4-5-29, so it's a 14-point lead to St Kilda at the six-minute mark of the third quarter. Back with umpire Shields, he bounces the ball, up goes Minor, the big knock, but it's taken by Heath, he's grabbed, loose his possession by Manzi, Heath recovers well, it's Greg with not in possession on the second occasion, and Kevin Heath will take the free kick, and big cows on the mark. I noticed when uh, Heath got out of the hands of the trainers, he ran right down the field and started to jostle cows, so obviously... Uh, Carl was the instigator of Heath going down on the ground. Kevin Heath now, wobbly old punt over the centre, up towards the half forward line. Martello nearly took the mark. He comes through the pack, comes to the ball again. Gets a handball to Ray Wilson. He's in trouble, goes out of his hands to Martello. Martello Sprague, when not in possession, gets his kick up towards Angus. Angus uh, can't mark the ball. Coming through is Moran. He socks the ball off the ground, up towards Basanko. Brenner in hot pursuit. Handball from Basanko back to Moran. He dummies well, gets out of trouble, gets his kick up towards centre half forward. Cowboy Neils here, he can't mark the ball, but in chip Stevenson for Hawthorne. A high kick by Stevenson. They set themselves on the wing, no one could mark it. Players going down like nine pins at the moment. A chance there for Smith. He's Craig with not in possession. And uh, Ross Smith will take the free kick on the wing on the outer side. And, um, and, and there's Ross, 15 yards too. And Ross Smith talked umpire Shields into that one. He pointed deli- uh, immediately to uh, where the ball had gone and the free kick 15 yards to field. High kick up towards the half forward line. meant for uh, Breen. Plays on the ground at the moment. And umpire Shields has seen a free kick. It's Oof. going Hawthorne's way to be taken by Big Norm Bustle in the back pocket. Hawthorne 4-5-29. St Kilda 6-7-43. 14 points in the Saints' favour. A wobbly kick by Bustle up towards the half-back line. It goes to Manzi. Manzi in turn to uh, Smith, but he can't control the ball. Players going down in, at the moment. David Parkin, is it? No, it's a Hawthorne player who was scraped to the ground. Looks like Matthews, is it? Yes, it is. And Matthews has got the free kick on the half-back line for Hawthorne. 
A torpedo punt by Matthews, just wide of the centre. Knocked down well by Scott, picked up by Hawthorne. They swing the ball up towards Hudson. Hudson is been no power, says the umpire. Nearly a Hudson mark, picked up by Angus. A left foot kick up towards Kenny, who's been quiet all day. But it inships Lawrence. He soccers the ball off the ground. That gives the chance for Trot. He's got the run of the ball. Porter coming in from right angles. Trot picks it up. A high kick up towards the wing on the member side. And it's been marked by Theodore. He takes the mark. Plays on. In plenty of trouble. Gets a long hand pass up to Carl. Dedrick gets the ball on the half forward line up towards Breen. He's in plenty of trouble. In fact, he's pushed by Bustle over the line. And there'll be a throw in on St Kilda's right half forward flank. Ten minutes of play in this third quarter. St Kilda 43, Hawthorne 29. The lead is 14 points. Dietrich and Beck. Beck gets the tap down towards Parkin. Parkin can't get boot to it when he was tackled by Bonnie. Bonnie scrapped to the ground. Umpire Shields moving in and calling for a bounce. Forward pocket for St Kilda. Dietrich and Beck again. Dietrich grabs it from the ruck. Kicks it in towards full forward. Breen in front is Bustle. And Bustle's got the mark. Bustle from the goal square now to boot Hawthorne out of danger. Not a good kick out towards the half-back line. In fact, a shocking kick. It's gone straight to Manzi of St Kilda. He steadies down. Punt kicks it in towards full forward. It may even go through. Parkin, great defensive play, David Parkin. Right over the pack and pumping it through for a minor score. St Kilda's lead is now 15 points. And the Hawks are pretty desperate. Ten minutes of play in this third quarter. And St Kilda looking dangerous. Had much more of a play, St Kilda, Peter, than Hawthorne this quarter. A little bit more pace, I think. St Kilda are 6 8 44. Hawthorne 4 5 29. Bustles kick out a long one towards the centre wing, and Kevin Heath has the mark. Superior judgment on that occasion. Handball goes to Moore. Moore's kicked towards the half forward line looking for Crimmins. He puts it out into open territory, but the only man home is St Kilda, and it's knocked forward by uh, Lawrence. We've got the double back now towards the half back line and eventually knocked over the boundary line for a throw in. Bob Kelly, the half forward flank of Hawthorne, has had only one kick in this match so far. He's been unsighted towards the half forward line taken by Wilson Wilson booting in towards full forward Martello front position not able to mark Colling in there for the Saints being pushed out towards the boundary line St Kilda defence very strong very rugged out towards the boundary line and knocked over by Vesanko for a boundary throw in boundary throw in minor against Scott in effective ruck work Knocked towards Keddy. Keddy about to be tackled by Neil. Gets a short kick in towards the forward pocket. Ross Smith there for St Kilda. Close to the boundary line. And in fact, oh. Smith is bundled across the line for a throw in. No umpire shields picking out a free kick. And it's going St Kilda's way. And it's going to Lawrence. Lawrence, who's done a great job on Hudson. Lawrence from back pocket out towards the half back line. Looking for Dietrich. Heath has front position. Second grab by Big Carl. Couldn't hold it though. Half forward line for Hawthorne. Crimmins trying to kick it off the ground. Then he took Ross Smith's head with him. That's taken by Colling. He's bundled out of the way. By golly, it's fierce out there. Ross Smith towards the half forward line. Beck misses the mark. In chips Theodore and carries it across the line for a throw in. Oh, it's a fierce game of football, this one. I was going to say, Thorold, it must be one of the toughest games for many years. Boundary throw in. Beck and Minor. The tap down going towards Heath. Plenty of weight thrown in at every opportunity. Taken by Heath back towards half four towards Martello. He couldn't make up the ground to mark it. Now it's Rice chipping in. He loses the ball. Back to Martello it goes. From 60 yards out, he's kicking towards full four. But Lawrence is there again. Five yards in front of Hudson and Lawrence wins out. Out towards the half back line. Dickridge up high with Beck. Dickridge takes it and then runs into uh, Ray Wilson. Now stocked forward by Elliott. But umpire Shields kick, blown Elliot. the whistle. And the free kick will go to Glenn Elliott of St Kilda. Kicking in danger, Pete. Big Carl Dietrich shaking his head as he met a stiffener from Ray Wilson then. Yes, he gives plenty out, but he's been receiving plenty too. The big fellow Elliot boots towards the half-forward line, and Stephen Ray has the opportunity. Two Hawthorne players vying with Ray. Now coming into assist is Moran, but Ray beats them all. Beats a paddock full of them, Stephen Ray, and boots the Saints into attack towards the half-forward line. The big leapers are there. Breen's got it. Play on! Play on! Play on calls umpire Shields. Green quick to uh, play on two. A long punt kick in towards the full forward line. It's close, it's a goal! Magnificent play by Barry Green. A 60 yarder. That's his second. And the same seven. And St Kilda have a lead of 20, 19. No, I can't work 21. <laughs> 21 points. 21 points. 7 8 50 St Kilda. Hawthorne 4 5 29. And here's Merrill Merrick. Back nice. with umpire Shields as the Saints get a grip on this game. Don Scott gets the knock down. It goes to Martello. He knocks it on, but Judson's in the way for St Kilda. He boots it up towards half forward. A chance now for Stephen Ray. One bounce on the half forward. A hand pass over to Davis. Davis slips at the psychological moment. Could be holding the ball. No. This allows Moore in for Hawthorne. Moore is grabbed solidly by. Uh, 
stopped by Davis. It comes back to Ray. Ray was being held, but play goes on. In towards centre half forward, in comes Theodore. But David Parkin relieves the pressure for Hawthorne with great defensive football. Gets it out towards the centre wing position on the grandstand side. Racing to it is Trot. Trot hotly pressed by Matthews. In the back is Trot. Trot get the free kick in the back. And beautifully, uh, beautifully staged. Here's that front position again. If you've got the front position, it's about 99% of the battle. He played it beautifully. Matthews was trailing along behind. He knew he was there and he waited for it. Brilliant play by Stewie Trot as he drives it up towards centre half forward. From behind it's Moore. Can't take the mark. A chance for Davis behind. Taps it cleverly across to Smith. Smith in the forward pocket. Fires a goal and puts oh. it through. Oh. A beautiful goal by Ross Smith. The Saints are getting a grip on the 1971 flag. The Saints are marching in at the moment. Four goals in 15 minutes in this quarter to no goals by Hawthorne. Eight goals, eight. 56 in Kilda. 4-5, 29 Hawthorne. And Hawthorne have only added one behind this quarter to St Kilda's four goals, two. From the centre bounce, an umpire Shields has picked out a free kick. It's going Don Scott's way. 15 minutes gone in this third quarter. The Saints really on top at the moment. Don Scott it with the free kick in the centre of the ground. It's a wobbly old kick by Scott up towards centre half forward. Martello goes up. It goes out the Hudson to Kitty. Kitty uh, left foot snap. It's going to be, I think, offline. Yes, it is. And it, uh, it'll be a throw in about four or five yards around from the Hawthorne behind post for the Hawks into attack and badly needing goals at the moment. Vintage Grandstand on ABC Radio and ABC Grandstand Digital. Can Hawthorne come back? Normally they've been well in front at this stage. Top tap down goes to Bremner. Bremner from back pocket out towards the centre wing. Up high was Pasenko and Martello. Not able to mark the ball though. Angus there. Now it's with Rice. Centre wing out of side and Cowboy Neal irons out Rice. A beautiful side bump. He'll feel that one tomorrow morning. Now it's with Dietrich. Dietrich boosts the Saints back into attack. Ma can't mark the ball. And oh, another fierce side bump. Opens the way for Stuart Trott. And Trott banged it in towards the goals. And hit, hit the, the post. post. Hit the post. The Saints' lead is 22 points. St Kilda, 8 9 57. Hawthorne, 4 5 29. In fact, uh, St Kilda's lead, of course, is 28 points. 57 to 29, a 28 point lead at the 22 minute mark of the third quarter. The kick in straight down the ground by Bustle. Bonnie is in there, was interfered with, and he'll take the free kick midway between centre half forward and the centre of the field. Not Bonnie, it's Stuart Trot. His kick smothered. Out towards the half forward flank it comes. In there is Wilson. He's bundled out of the way. Stewie Trot tries to kick it off the ground. Dietrich is in there with Wilson, but Wilson gets up and gets the ball away. Comes back to Trot. Trot oh! Oh! Matthews lined him up. And a free kick going against Lee Matthews for a very vigorous bump indeed. And Stewie bump. Trot bump. Wasn't a bump. It was though. an elbow. Even the umpire bad it reported. That. Roy, I couldn't see it because of this pillar in front of my. Uh, I like the way Matthew shakes here. his head in yeah. saying no every time he does that sort a of thing. A deliberate charge from. with Boy, a right. very, very reportable? stiff... Uh, my word, it was reportable. Well, I couldn't see it, Roy, because of this pillar in front of me, but uh, obviously it was a pretty stiff one, but Stewie Trot took a while to get up, and he's very, very groggy. Boots it to the half-forward flank, and it just eludes Davis and goes out of bounds on the half-forward flank. Well, that's an evener up for the one Dietrich gave Heath and a uh, very spiteful game this as the ball is thrown in half forward flank Wilson gets to it from the centre bounce from the throw in, boots it down towards centre wing Minot flies, almost takes the mark it hits ground, in there is Matthews and he gets one in the back Matthews takes the ball plays on quickly with a punt kick right up towards the half forward flank uh, Cowboy Neil flies, can't take the mark Hudson cleverly taps it over his head towards uh, Keddie Keddie's there, so too is Rice Rice has it in the forward pocket, kicks it at goal and puts it through he a miraculous it. goal well that's a long awaited goal for Hawthorne kicked from a brilliant piece of play by Hudson when he tapped it overhead it took Rice, a long while to pick it up, Roy, but when he did, he popped it through from a difficult angle, so well, that's... And under pressure too, Thorold. He was bumped just as he kicked it. He did a great job. Hawthorne's first goal for the quarter. They moved to 5-5-35. St Kilda, 8-9-57. Back with umpire Shields. Minot wins the tap down again. Neil's in the ruck now for St Kilda. As Ross Smith forces his way through the pack, he's got it at half forward, handballs it out in front of him. Bremner gets in the way for Hawthorne and relieves the pressure by booting it out wide to the half-back flank. Heath racing to it. Will he get it? Now it's over the line and out of bounds. Half-forward flank. 
for St Kilda on the outer side. Free kick, St Kilda 40 to Hawthorne 36. And marks Hawthorne 30 to St Kilda 25. Score is Hawthorne 35, trailing St Kilda 57. Throw in on the outer side wing. Minders and Scott doing battle, but the Minder gets a tap down, goes to Elliott, he taps it further afield, but goes straight to Wilson. A left foot kick by Wilson, up towards centre half forward. Hudson a long way out from goal at the moment. A chance here for St Kilda, they relieve the pressure through Pays. Up towards the wing, a chance here for Theodore, and in comes uh, Davis. Davis uh, just about to get his tickets, uh, grabbed by Ma, but Theodore comes back to the ball again in the centre. A left foot oh. kick in towards centre half forward, meant for Neil, but it's Wilson taking the mark between the centre and centre half back for Hawthorne. Ray Wilson, a long kick up towards centre-half forward. Beck gets interfered with and must take the free kick in the back. 25 minutes gone, third term. St Kilda, 8-9-57. Hawthorne, 5-5-35. The difference now, 22 points. And big Ken Beck. A long kick up towards the full forward line. Hudson goes up, pushed away. Umpire says play on, picked up by Colling. He's a defensive kick out towards Angus. Angus has a flying shot for goal. And it's through for one behind to Hawthorne. That was the goal that Hawthorne really needed with three-quarter time looming here at the MCG. The scoreboard reads, St Kilda 8-9-57, Hawthorne 5-6-36. The difference now, 21 points, and the Saints doing it well. Yes, Hudson going a long way out from goal, about 40 yards out, and now Keddie is dropping back. The kick by Lawrence out towards the half-back line goes to ground. Kicked off the ground by Dietrich out towards the wing on the outer side. And the ball beats Pays over the line and there'll be a further throw-in. A lot of throw, throw-ins on that far outer side wing today. Scott and Minot in the ruck. Knocked down by Scott, but it's uh, not well directed. Goes to St Kilda, but uh, uh, Angus picks up the ball when it's deflected away. Swings it up towards the half-forward line. A chance here for Hawthorne. The ball's at centre-half forward. Scrambly play at the moment, but umpire Shields doesn't let a, a, a big pack develop, although there's a couple of players on the ground, and he'll call for a bounce at centre-half forward. Big Martello hasn't done much today for Hawthorne. There goes the ball up, and it's uh, knocked down by Minot. Further afield, picked up by Wilson, who's played well since he came on. Wilson steadies the long kick up towards Keddie and Colling. It's off their hands and forced through for one behind. 26 minutes gone, third term, and the scoreboard now. St Kilda, 8-9-57, Hawthorne, 5-7-37. The difference is 20 points. Lawrence will no doubt favour the outer side flank. He's done that all day. A drop punt, a good one too, covering about 60 yards up to Martin Scott. Punched away by Scott. The ball going up towards the centre of the ground now. Heath's got the front position. Cowboy Neil after him. Josses him away. Gets his, uses his body well, but it comes back to Heath. His kick is smothered. Kicked off the ground by Wilson, who's played well. Wilson's kick up towards the half-forward line. Mars leading the race for the ball. And I think both players, both Mar and Bonnie, were pleased to see it go over the line throw in. Scott the front position but knocked down by Minot. Interference against Minot and will be taken by Scott. Well Scott front position. He's reversed his role again. Ninth free kick for Scott. Scott on the wing on the member side. Hawthorne kicking towards the Richmond end. Traditional punt kick by Scott in towards the pocket. Hudson up. Can't mark it on the second bite. Uh, kicked off the ground by Ross Smith. Ooh, and really out the full too. Nearly out in the full, and there'll be a throw-in on Hawthorne's left half-forward flank. Minot and Beck. Beck gets the tap down, goes to Crimmins. Crimmins has a flying shot for goal, Why not but there's three. a free kick. I think uh, Becky put a hand on his shoulder on his back, and the free kick will go to Brian Minot on the half-back line. It's a 20... great tussles in the ruck today with each uh, player, respective player trying to get that front position because Empire Shield's paying free kicks. I see Carl going up to the back line at the moment. Uh, he just came James. down and had a word to the, one of the trainers... Uh, I well, think James, Minot's in trouble, or Carl, is he? Carl well, himself. Maybe. Actually, I think probably uh, Carl may be playing as a loose man on the back line in the latter stages to try and prevent Hawthorne from scoring a goal. Anyway, it's just wide of centre-half forward, and there's a ball up in that position, and they've played 28 minutes in this third term and three-quarter time looming here at the MCG. 57 to 37, the Saints lead is 20 points, taken by Basenko, his short kick finds Ray in the centre, this could be dangerous for the Hawks, Ray from the centre of the ground, booting in towards the half forward line, St Kilda's forward line, very open, knocked away by Bustle, now Breen out towards the ball on the half forward line, can he get around Bustle, dodging, twisting, weaving and turning, eventually kicks it back towards the half forward line, and the mark is taken by Stephen Ray. Very close to three quarter time, 29 minutes of play now, Ray on the half forward line for St Kilda, 
sending a punt kick which is dropping a little short in towards full forward and Bremner has the mark Bremner about 35 yards out from the defensive goal for Hawthorne as the siren goes for three quarter time a great quarter for the Saints and at three quarter time in the 1971 grand final St Kilda are 8-9-57 Hawthorne 5-7 a total of 37 the goal kickers to three quarter time Peter Hudson still has only three so he's on the 150 goals and he needs one at least in the last quarter to break Bob Pratt's record one also to Rice and one to Crimmins in fact the only goal for Hawthorne in that quarter kicked by Rice Goals for St Kilda, two to Bonnie, two to Breen, and one apiece to Smith, Trot, Theodore, and Manzi. Vintage Grandstand on ABC Radio and ABC Grandstand Digital. Three quarter time in the 1971 VFL Grand Final. Hope you're enjoying it via ABC Grandstand Digital and via the ABC Listen app. Coming up the final quarter, also hear from Barry Breen and Peter Hudson. So stay with us on Grandstand, an exciting final quarter that had a little bit of it all. So Matt Clinch, Alison Nicholson and Mark McClure to be with you after the latest from the ABC Newsroom. ABC News with Satyam Weinstein. The last post has rung out in suburban streets this morning as thousands commemorated Anzac Day at home amid cancelled dawn services due to coronavirus. Holly Tregenza reports. There were no veterans marching toward the Australian War Memorial in Canberra, though people did turn out onto the street, but only as far as their driveways. With dawn services cancelled around the country, thousands tuned in to the commemorative service broadcast from the capital. Prime Minister Scott Morrison honoured veterans in isolation or working at the front line of the COVID crisis. Lest we forget. Those who couldn't attend a service paid their respects by lighting a candle before dawn and observing a minute silence at 11am. In Western Australia, many took the opportunity to mark Anzac Day despite social distancing restrictions cancelling traditional dawn services. Across the state, people answered the RSL's call to stand on their driveways and join services broadcast online on radio and TV. Among those was Don Scoggins, who gathered with her neighbours in East Perth to hold their own service. She says it was heartening to be able to remember her father, who served in the South African Navy in World War II. It means a huge amount and we're very fortunate in this apartment block that this was organised amongst the residents that we could still pay tribute. The national coronavirus death toll has risen to 80 after a 90-year-old man from Tasmania's northwest passed away from COVID-19. The Premier, Peter Gutwin, says that a 90-year-old man from the state's Northwest died, taking the state's toll to 10. The man was being cared for at the Mercy Community Hospital. Mr Gutwin says his thoughts are with the man's family. Four new infections at a nursing home in Sydney's west are among a dozen extra COVID-19 cases reported in New South Wales. Two residents and two staff members at Anglicare's New March House tested positive in the past 24 hours. It follows the death of 96-year-old resident yesterday, the fifth fatality at the site. Queensland's recorded two new more coronavirus cases overnight, while health authorities are also in the process of contacting passengers who flew on flight VA341 from Melbourne to Brisbane on Monday after a person on that flight tested positive for COVID-19. And the Victorian government says there's been three new cases of coronavirus diagnosed in that state. One of these is a new case at a Melbourne psychiatric facility that's experiencing an outbreak. The state has so far had 1,346 diagnosed cases. All but 84 of those people have now recovered. And the family and federal circuit courts will rush through parenting disputes over children during the coronavirus crisis after reporting a sharp increase in calls for help. Matthew Doran reports from Parliament House. Chief Justice Will Ostergren says a special process will be put in place to deal with urgent family cases within 72 hours as COVID-19 social restrictions put extra strain on already fragile families. Cases where there's an increased risk of family violence or where the closure of state borders mean children can't spend time with each parent are among those that will be fast-tracked. The two courts share responsibility for intervening in family law matters in Australia. The Family Court has reported a 39% increase in 
urgent applications over the last month, while the Federal Circuit Court has seen a 23% spike in cases. Sri Lanka's imposed a countrywide 24-hour curfew following a surge in coronavirus cases. Officials say 46 new infections were reported yesterday, the highest daily number since the outbreak began. Sri Lanka's recorded a total number 420 confirmed cases and seven deaths. The government has lifted a 24-hour curfew. And Papua New Guinea's Prime Minister says the country will take control of a major mine after refusing an application from the current operator. Natalie Whiting with the details. The world's second biggest gold mining company, Barrick Gold, is the majority owner of the Porgara mine in Papua New Guinea's highlands. The company's been in discussions since 2017 for a 20-year lease extension, but the Papua New Guinean government has announced it is refusing the application. PNG's Prime Minister, James Marape, says the decision is in light of long-standing environmental and resettlement issues, and he says the state will take control to own and operate it after a transition phase. But Barrick says it will be pursuing all legal avenues to challenge the decision. And a Russian cargo capsule carrying fuel, water and food has completed a successful docking at the International Space Station. You're listening to... Nice bit of shepherding by frame, but... Go! It's a goal! No. Yes, it is! Boots in towards goal. We've got Hudson. Centering kick for Brownless. Sets himself. Ablitz. Ablitz marked it. You watch the fight, Doug. I'll watch the footy. Lock it. Left foot. Goal. Look at that big pack of balls. Great mark to Royce Hart. Compton picks up the ball, slams it goal, and puts it through. Sheldon picks it up. Runs it on over goal. Ooh. Who's there? Shimmel Bush and Bremner. In comes Egan Knight. Takes the magnificent mark right over the top. On ABC Radio and ABC Grandstand Digital. Oh, there's the siren. This is Vintage Grandstand. You're listening to the 1971 Grand Final on Vintage Grandstand this afternoon with Alistair Nicholson, Matt Clinch and Mark McClure in a moment. Barry Breen from the Saints is going to join us. And later on in this hour, Peter Hudson will be reliving the final quarter. We've already had the opening three quarters of the game. It's been a, a really tight, tough contest, but St Kilda by 20 points at three-quarter time. The Saints had got out to a 28-point lead when Stuart Trott hit the post late in the third term, but Hawthorne would come with a rush. Barry Breen, a key part of the St Kilda team that day, has joined us on the line. G'day, Barry. Gentlemen, how are we? Really nice well, thank you. you. Nice to be with you as well. It's three-quarter time in the grand final as we're replaying it today. As a St Kilda player, having had such a good third term, what are you thinking at the three-quarter time huddle and what's Alan Jean saying to you? <laughs> I'm not thinking much at all. I don't want to see the last quarter or hear the last quarter. <laughs> it's, it's like Greg Norman imploding in 1996 against McFeldo. I can't watch it. Can't bring myself to do it. Oh, look, it was it was a pretty hard game all the way through, and uh, we obviously thought that we were in with a chance at three-quarter time. And uh, um, But we had a couple of issues in the third quarter that, that sort of, upset us a little bit. Um, Michael Porter whacked Carl pretty extensively and, and virtually took him out of the game after his great third quarter and, and that gave the momentum to Don Scott in the ruck at the start of the of the last quarter and, and saw Ketty and kick four or five goals in that last quarter and he shouldn't have been on the ground. He should have been dragged at three quarter time but they were out of play. <laughs> they couldn't put anybody else on. It was a, a real battle of attrition, wasn't it? So we've asked our, our guests um, throughout the afternoon, what, what do you think it was about that game and, and preceding matches between St Kilda and, and Hawthorne that made them such physical encounters? Well, we were obviously very good sides at that, in, at that time and, and the games were always physical. It was the way Jeansy coached, it was the way Kennedy coached and... And the players that both sides had um, that were very hard at it and very physical. And uh, the games were always a really great contest and, and uh, it really didn't matter at what position we were on the table at the time. They were always very physical and uh, the, the 71 grand final was certainly no exception. And, and James and Kennedy both said it was the toughest grand final of all time and it didn't seem like that when you're playing it, but when you look back and see some of the stuff that went on, it, it, it probably was pretty hard. You must have learned a lot off uh, Alan Jeans. He's uh, been a super coach, and he was he coached both clubs to lots. He had nine times in the finals when he was there for 15 years, Baz, and you were there most of those times. Uh, he was most a terrific times. man, and 
Uh, you were very close to him. I was, and uh, a great mentor in, in not only my, my football career, but also um, uh, my life, and um, he was uh, a great influence on me. He got better as a coach as he went on. There was no doubt about that. Um, he had good sides at St Kilda, and some will say that um, he should have had more success. Um, but he certainly fulfilled all that, um, that potential that he had as a coach at Hawthorne. Admittedly, with some very, very, very good footballers, but he was a good coach, as was Kennedy. Um, yeah. And I was lucky to spend most of my career being coached by him. What did he uh, say to you? Very fortunate. What did he say to you when he saw you with your hairdryer on at three <laughs> minutes after the game? <laughs> oh, Mark. No, Mark. seriously, Barry. What did, what did he say Mark. to you? He said, Mark. hang on a second, I don't coach blokes like this. Guys, I've been retired from Belleville for six months. I thought I got past all this. Um, <laughs> well, look, it was... Hey, Terence Marini was in Turak Road. Terence Marini. Your, <laughs> what we used to go to. Um, Jimmy O'Day was always amazed. But, uh, hey, how do you get your hair looking so good? I said, Jimmy, have a look at my bag. And he fell over. <laughs> um, look, it... <sighs> Yeah, which is something we did in those days, Mark. You, you <laughs> had your little idiosyncrasies at Carlton, and I won't tell anybody. Yeah, we now, went to the aftermath because we were thirsty, not to look good. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon there's a completely different conversation to be had with Barry about his days working with Mark McClure, but uh, that oh, might be... You haven't, got, you haven't got enough time. Haven't got long enough, <laughs> Barry. Can you paint the picture of a, a typical week in those days uh, for a footballer? Obviously, uh, very different to today in that you were all with your full-time jobs. I mean, Alan Jeans himself as the coach of the, the footy club is... A, a policeman during the week. What what's the build up and and um, everything that goes into the preparation for a grand final or even any normal week of football for a play back then? Well, it was it was always pretty intense in terms of what we had to do during the week, and um, it was three or four nights. Um, it might have been lunchtime. Jeansy uh, was a policeman in Russell Street in those days, and we would he'd bring us up to the gym at. Um, at lunchtime, we had to work out up there with himself and Sid McRae, who was the head trainer at uh, Richmond at the time, and then came to St Kilda. So we we're always working on our game in, in conjunction with the full-time jobs we had. Both Mark and I will tell you that those jobs weren't all that difficult in terms of the time we had to spend at them, but Excuse we me? had to be there. <laughs> hey, Mark. What were start. you doing, Barry? I was a sales representative at that stage for a dresser game. Multigraph, who were a printing company out of the US, and my dad worked there, and so he got me a job, and I was there for a couple of years, and um, then I went into the finance business, and uh, but and that was a serious job, and but you know you'd have to leave work at four thirty and get the training by mm. five, and all that sort of stuff. It was always after work that you did the training; it was never during the course of the day, and that was that's certainly the difference today. Yeah, but it was good work profession. life balance, Baz. That was the key. Instead of just being totally. In, engage with football uh, as well, yes. so it was it, well, it was a break up the day, and, and you'd love to go to training. And we it. did, and it might get back to that in the reset of, of the competition after COVID nineteen, and with less coaches and and less people around the footy club, it might get back to what it was back in those days, which produced still produced good footballers and good footy. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. It was interesting when you look at the two teams. They go to sixty one. They both you you sixty one. They win a premiership. You win sixty six. You go into the game with one premiership each. I know what you're going to say, mate. And what? They, what, they? what am I going to say? <laughs> they have won thirteen. Fourteen and won one. one. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> I, I, heard I, that I, before. Can, I can do the maths. <laughs> what about the wooden spoons? Haven't brought that one up yet. Well, I, I, I was saving that one up for later. <laughs> <laughs> Barry, it's uh, Matt Clinch here. A bit of the story around Carl Dittrich that he missed out in 66 with suspension. Um, what are your memories of his game in the grand final? In 71? Um, well, I thought he played the best quarter of football a Ruckman had ever played in a grand final. He he was a catalyst behind us getting that 28 points in front and lots of other good players around him, obviously, at that time. But his third quarter was magnificent and um, until Porter whacked him and it was a... It was it didn't knock him out, but it certainly concussed him. And uh, then we didn't see much of him in the final quarter, and there were some doubts whether he could go on at three-quarter time. So um, that certainly took a lot of the momentum out of what we'd built up. And, and look, at three-quarter time, we you never think you've got a grand final one. You can never do that. But we thought we were in a very, very good position here um, if we could just get off to a good start in that final quarter. And we didn't, and we could never regain the momentum that, that Hawthorne had. And 
although we only got beaten by seven points, it, it probably seemed a little bit more than that. We were always in it, but we, we couldn't just get that momentum back. You had some stars in that side, Bazza, when you think about it, but, uh, oh, for, for a long yeah. period of time, and uh, uh, it would have been a bit of fun playing there, I tell you. Well, it was. Well, you know, you, you know John McIntosh, Bob Murray, who got injured early. You had John Bonney, who was a very, very good player, Stewie Trott, Rossi Smith. Um, I remember Stewie um, Trott and you talking to me down in Tasmania. Yeah, that was a long night. Um, yeah. And um, <laughs> Barry yeah. Lawrence had... Barry Lawrence had <laughs> yeah. Mark, you're a shock. Um, <laughs> you, you never did anything wrong with St Kilda, but you didn't win. What was going on? No, look, Mark, I'm not falling into this stuff. <laughs> I've done it before, and I'm not going there again. We were beaten by a much better side on the day. We should have won it. We could have won it, and we didn't. Yeah, that but happens. That it, happens. It, was, it happened to Carlton. It's happened, it happened to a lot everywhere. of sides. Everyone. And it, unfortunately, it's happened to St Kilda more often than most. I'm glad to see you taking it well, too. <laughs> Barry, if it makes you feel any better, we've got a pretty good understanding of what you've gone through over those years working with Sellers. So <laughs> no, you haven't. I'm telling you, you haven't. <laughs> Even if our listeners don't. Uh, thanks for taking a trip down memory lane with us and, uh, yeah, Great. maybe turn right. off the last quarter. Marker, I'll talk to you later, mate. Don't worry. You won't. I'm putting <laughs> thanks, your phone off. Bye. Barry yeah. Green joining us Bye. in our uh, look back on memory lane, the 1971 VFL Grand Final. So it's all set up. With the Saints leading by 20 points, uh, let's take you to our call of the final quarter with Peter Ewan, Peter Booth, Theryl Merritt and Roy Wright. Here's the call of the final quarter. Umpire Shields about the signal to the timekeepers and play will be underway in the final quarter of football for season 1971. Here's the bounce. Knocked forward by Scott, goes to Maher, Hawthorne into attack towards the half-forward line. Up high, Lawrence couldn't mark the ball, but recovers well. At centre-half forward for Hawthorne, and Lawrence kicks it off the ground, out of danger, but not for long, because it goes straight to Stevenson. Stevenson goes for a run from the centre of the ground, booting towards the half-forward line for Hawthorne, but a great mark to Cowboy Neal. That'll be 15 yards yards against Peter Crimmins too, I would imagine. Kicking it off the ground after Cowboy Neal had marked the ball, and indeed it is. So from the back pocket, Neil will now take this kick from the half-back flank. Favouring a punt kick, good 60 yard or two towards the half-forward line. Looking for Dittrich, he couldn't mark it, Ray's in the thick of things, overruns the ball, back to Dittrich he goes. Can't get boot to the ball, however, taken away by Rice. Rice's boot towards the half-forward line for Hawthorne. Bounces over in territory, Hudson and uh, Lawrence. Now it's with a St Gilda player there, Judson, tackled by Matthews. And umpire Shields has decided it's holding the ball. Free kick going to Matthews. That was a really... Uh, Tough decision. Still Matthews from 65 yards out. A punt kick is on its way. It might be there. It is there. It's a goal to Hawthorne. Hawthorne, sixth goal. The difference is now only 14 points. St Kilda, 8-9, 57. Hawthorne, 6-7, 43. Roy Wright. Well, I think this is a obviously a vital quarter, but whether or not now the playing of three matches in a row for St Kilda is going to tell this will be the quarter. There's the bounce again. Scott getting the knockdown. Taken away, though, by Elliot of St Kilda. Elliot's kicked towards the half-forward line. In front is Bonnie. Behind is Parkin. Nobody able to mark the ball. Play on calls umpire Shields. The handball goes to Davis. He's in a nest of Hawthorne players and had to lose it, which he did. Taken away by Bustle. His kick towards the centre wing. Nobody able to mark the ball. Trying to burst his way through is Matthews. Out it goes to Vasanko. Now it's with Maher. Maher's kicked towards the half-forward line. Out towards Hudson and Lawrence. Hudson well out from goals. Lawrence cleverly tucks the ball behind him, which gives it to Stuart Trott. But Trot kicks a bad one, taken by Ma. Ma sending Hawthorne back into attack towards full forward. Nobody able to mark the ball. It comes down towards Keddy. He can't pick up the ball. Half forward line for Hawthorne. Now it's with Keddy. A left foot kick by Keddy in towards full forward. But there's nobody home for the Hawks. That's marked by Moran. Moran along 40 yard handball to Cowboy Neal. Brothers Travis Pays. Pays boots towards the centre wing, and the mark is taken by Bremner. Bremner to send Hawthorne back into attack towards the half forward line. Rice and behind is uh, Theodore, but the mark has been paid to Rice and he plays on, but he'll have to come back. Three minutes of play in this final quarter. Hawthorne have done nearly all the attacking. Rice from the centre wing. Drop punt, not a good one, towards the half forward line. In front, uh, St Kilda's Moran, taken away by Basenko. Basenko boots into the centre, over the head of Dittrich. Gives the chance for Hawthorne to bounce back into attack through Moore. His kick towards the half forward line, just over the head of Matthews. And Lawrence is there again. He's played a great game, Lawrence and Hudson. Out towards Theodore, it goes in the centre wing. Theodore gets a good bounce, gets away from Porter. And from the centre wing, the Saints move into attack towards half forward. But the mark is held by Kilvin Moore. Moore from the half back line to send Hawthorne out of danger. A long punt kick uh, out to the outer half forward flank. A chance there for Ma. He can't take the mark. He's still in there fighting for the ball. 
being hotly pressed and he'll get the free kick he played for it and he got it play on as he kicks the ball up towards Matthews in the forward pocket Matthews waiting for the ball to arrive the opponent Moran, Moran crashes into his back and Matthews will take the free kick out on the half forward flank out of side a long punt kick by Matthews right up towards Hudson they fly a chance here for Stevenson he overruns the ball runs into trouble good defensive football by St Kilda a chance for Martello he fights through the pack Gets it out towards Kenny. Kenny pops it through. The difference is only eight points. Kenny's third or fourth kick for the game. And he's put through a valuable goal to Hawthorne as they move to 7-7-49. St Kilda 8-9-57. Have St Kilda put too much into the third quarter? And are they stopping to a walk? Only time will tell as they lead by eight points four minutes into the final quarter two goals this quarter by Hawthorne and St Kilda yet to score Roy Wright well as I said before Farrell this is the time whether the games in a row is going to tell on them Hawthorne coming forward again Martello up towards full forward punched away by Colling Cribbins coming in he's running an open goal Cribbins steadies and he's put it through for a goal that's the second goal to Cribbins and the difference is only two points. St Kilda, 8-9-57, Hawthorne, 8-7-55, and the Hawks have three goals in five minutes. And from a very comfortable position, St Kilda with their backs to the wall. Hudson out to centre half forward, Kerry to full forward. Hawthorne doing all the attacking in the first part of this final quarter. And someone's taken the ball too, they won't hand it back to the police and the goal umpire. Well, five minutes gone in the final quarter. St Kilda, 8-9-57. Hawthorne, 8-7-55. So the Hawks have added three straight goals. St Kilda have not scored in the first five and a half minutes of this first term. Well, Hudson has three goals to take his total to 150. And I'm wondering whether Bob Pratt's, or bettering Bob Pratt's record, will elude him today. Not the way that Hawthorne are playing at the moment, because if they continue in this pattern, he'll get plenty of opportunity, although he's added centre-half forward. New ball. Yes, the ball has been hijacked as a souvenir. And there's a new ball. Umpire Shields bounces it. Up they go. Knocked down by Scott. He's won nearly every knockout this uh, quarter. Picked up by Moran. He can't get rid of the ball. Picked up by Hawthorne through Matthews. Swinging the ball up to... Oh, oh Lawrence and Hudson. Lawrence flew high above Hudson. Hudson's on the ground at the moment. He hasn't moved. Picked up by uh, Matthews. Matthews into Kenny. And Kenny, no. Yes, he's been paid the mark. He's only 25 yards out on a 15-degree angle. That's his first mark. He's had six kicks, and this could put Hawthorne in the lead. It'll be the first time since, I'd say, very early in the first quarter. Bob Kenny, a drop punt. I think he's just a bit. He's put it through for one point only. Well, I thought it looked pretty good by the way the goal umpire moved, and the difference is only one point. I'm wondering whether we could be here again next week. Don't say things like that. St Kilda, 8-9-57, Hawthorne, 8-8-56, seven minutes gone in the grand final, final quarter. Kick off to be taken by Lawrence, what a great game he's played. <laughs> Drop punt out towards the halfback flank on the other side of the ground and Minot has the mark. Umpire Shields paying the mark to Brian Minot. We've been playing for eight minutes in this final quarter. St Kilda 57, Hawthorne 56. Minot, who looks very weary, punt kick out towards the centre wing. They all fly. Coming down with the ball is Porter. Has he been paid the mark? He has. Porter, down from the centre wing, slightly towards the half forward line for Hawthorne. Punt kick on its way, back into attack for Hawthorne towards Hudson, and he's got it. Hudson's got it. Hudson wasting no time. A long kick by Hudson will land in the goal square. They set themselves. Matthews almost held it with Kitty. A snap shot by Kitty's a point. Scores are level. In eight minutes of play in this final quarter, St Kilda, who led by 20 points at three-quarter time, now find themselves dead level. 8-9 Hawthorne, 8-9 St Kilda. The St Kilda messenger is going to be a very weary man tonight. Out on the ground he goes again as the kick offs out towards the centre wing. Opportunity for Cowboy Neal. He's kicked back towards the half-forward lane for St Kilda. Taken by Manzi. Manzi, short pass in towards centre-half forward. And it's Barry Breen in possession. Breen to boot St Kilda deep into attack. A long kick by Breen. Going down towards full forward and Moore has the mark. Delvin Moore, who's been one of Hawthorne's great defenders. 
About 25 yards out from Hawthorne's defensive goal. Back to the centre it goes. Dittrich in front position, knocked down by Minot. Gives the opportunity, however, for Bustle. Bustle's kick is smothered. It goes back to Minot in the centre, and Minot can hardly pick himself up in the centre, and he's going to get a free kick. Very weary man is Brian Minot. Very lucky to get that free kick. He sat on the ball, made no endeavour to get rid of it. Still, he's got the ball towards the half forward line it goes. Opportunity for Dittrich. Tries to break his way clear, not successful. Taken away by Parkin. Parkin to the centre wing to Maher. Ma has the mark, centre wing out of side. Waste no time. Shocking kick by Ma towards the half forward line. Judson and Crimmins doing battle on the half back line for St Kilda out of side. And Judson takes it across the boundary line for a throw in. Ten minutes of play. Final quarter for 1971. Scores are level. Minot and Scott. Now it's taken by Wilson. Wilson's kicking towards full forward. Knocked uh, forward by Hudson out towards Martello. Martello from centre half forward. Pumps it in towards full forward. Colling and Keddie having a wrestling match in the goal square. And Keddie's got it. Well, they were virtually linked arm in arm, Keddie and Colling. And as they fell to the ground, Keddie plucked it in with the left arm. And from point blank range, the Hawks will hit the front. John Kennedy jumped three feet in the air when Kenny took that mark. The coach of Hawthorne. Twelve yards out. It's a six-pointer. Hawthorne lead by six points. Kenny's second goal. It's Hawthorne, nine-nine. St Kilda, eight-nine. The first time they've led since the 26-minute mark in the, the first, first quarter. quarter. That's right. Roy, what a battle of tactics it's been. Who would have thought that John Kennedy would have moved the champion full forward away from goal? put Keddie there and he to kick these two goals. The two vital ones. Had to do something. This is Vintage Grandstand on ABC Radio and ABC Grandstand Digital. 15 minutes of play in the grand final, final quarter for Sanko, driving mm. St Kilda towards the half forward line, Breen to fly from behind and raving the pack is Pays. Awkward bounce for Travis Pays and this splits Rice in for Hawthorne. Beautiful handball goes to Parkin. Parkin drives Hawthorne into attack to Scott. Scott a left footer in towards the full forward line and Kenny can race into an open goal if he can reach it. It's bounced and it's bounced through for a goal. Nobody touched it in transit. He beat them all and that goal to Don Scott. Left kick 5-3 to no score in this final term, Hawthorne. Hawthorne 10-10. 70. A lead now of 13 points over St Kilda. 8-9. 57. A freak goal into Don Scott. There's the bounce. Galt against Scott. Galt gets the tap down towards Dittrich. He can't break clear. Moran can, though. From the centre wing, the Saints move into attack. Down towards full forward. Davis and more and more has the mark. Great mark. Davis has been absolutely thrashed by Kelvin Moore this afternoon. Strange part when Nia Breen was there, they looked a good side. Moore back towards the centre of the ground, taken by Rice. He's grabbed. Umpire Shields deciding the ball held to Rice and a bounce will happen at the centre-half forward position for St Kilda. Hawthorne 43 free kicks, St Kilda 44. Play in the centre now. Opportunity for Rice to drive Hawthorne forward. Now it's with Martello. Hawthorne move towards the half-forward line. Matthews coming out to meet Judson. Matthews just gets it across towards Crimmins. Now it's gone towards Barr, who's been a star in this revival for Hawthorne. His short kick towards the half-forward line. Taken by Moran. His kick goes up and down on the one spot. Nobody able to mark it. Back to Crimmins it comes. Crimmins has plenty of time to steady down. Punt kick on its way to full forward. Travis pays the leaper, couldn't mark it. Three St Kilda against one Hawthorne. That's Kenny. And Kenny beats them all. Snapshot by Kenny. It may be a goal. It would be a freak if it is. It is. Three goals to Kenny, as Thorold said, and there have been some freak goals by the Hawks in this fantastic revival in the final quarter. Hawthorne 11 10, 76, a lead now of 19 points over St Kilda, who are 8 9, 57, Roy Wright. Well, he's switching of Kenny, obviously the key to the game because those three be magnificent goals in this quarter the big difference between the sides now Green back to full forward for the Saints and Kilda back into attack through Theodore his long kick towards full forward towards Breen he couldn't mark the ball though the opportunity for Bonnie certain goal for the Saints Bonnie's put it through the difference is back to 13 points Bonnie's third and that's the first goal for St Kilda in this final quarter the question is now can they come back too late the move, I feel. They should have had Breen down there at full forward. The scoreboard is Hawthorne 11 10, 76. St Kilda 9 9, 63. The difference is 13 points. There's nothing in it as Thorough Merritt takes up the commentary. Roy, I think the big move there for St Kilda was Cowboy Neal into the ruck. He got the big knockout. Back it is with umpire Shields. Don Scott 
Is he stopping to a walk as he gets that knockout? And Martello punches at 30 yards towards goal for Hawthorne. It's up at their centre half forward position. Judson coming across the front of the pack. Gets the kick in but puts it straight back to Rice. Rice in turn. Up towards Kerry again. And Kerry is marked 12 Might yards be a 15 out. yard too. He handballed the Hudson Bowl. He can't do it. He, he cannot do it. He, he can't do that. Hudson and he's not being allowed because that is Hudson's 151 first goal, but it's not being allowed. Look, Kenny was over the over his mark when he handballed to Hudson. Well, you'd have to be here to just see this revival to believe it. And Hawthorne's that was the most sensational piece of play of the day, I would think, because of the importance of Hudson getting 151 goals. Kenny had taken the mark and fallen well over where he'd taken it. Handballed it to Hudson after the play had stopped. Hudson kicked his 151 first goal, but it wasn't allowed. But Keddie's is, and Keddie has kicked four goals this quarter. And Hawthorne now have back to 19 points in front. 12-10, 82 to St Kilda, 9-9-63. Roy Wright. Well, four goals in the last five minutes. Three to Hawthorne and one to St Kilda. But that was a correct decision because Keddie was well over the mark when he hand passed to Hudson. The switch has been made too, Roy, which uh, wasn't too long in coming. Gary Conning has been moved off Bob Keddie and, in fact, Neil Vasenko has taken up that post. Back with umpire Shields. Scott wins the tap down again and uh, Galt takes it in the second uh, attempt. In comes Moore, taps it cleverly across to uh, Bremner. Bremner forces his way through the pack, boots it up towards centre-half forward. Lawrence can't take the mark. Pays is there, but the free kick will go Lawrence's way for interference after it uh, flew for the mark, and he takes the kick. He finds Colling on the, not Colling, uh, Pays, half-back flank. Pays in turn finds uh, Trot out on the centre wing. Trot looking for Davis, and he's found him, and St Kilda have gone from one end of the ground to the other as Davis lines it up, and is it going across the face of goal? It's through for a goal to St Kilda by Davis. 13 points the difference again. 22 minutes of play in this final quarter. We're right. Well, it's uh, been a magnificent final, Peter. I feel that uh, without doubt it's all over because uh, Hawthorne are just finishing that little bit too fit for St Kilda. The attendance today, 118,192, which is 3,000 less than the record. From the centre bounce again, Scott gets the tap down. It goes to Porter. Left foot kick by Porter. Up towards Beck and uh, Pays. Off their hands. Well raised by Crimmins. Crimmins streaming down field to Keddy. But oh, in front of Keddy, chips Bozanko. 22 minutes gone in the grand final. In the final quarter, Bozanko's kick. Up towards the member side wing. Ray in front. Can't get the ball. Rossi Smith coming through. Deflects it over the line. And there'll be a throw in. In front of the member smokers stand here at the MCG. Hawthorne have taken over on the wings, I think, Roy. In this last quarter particularly. The Hawks lead by 13 points, and from that uh, throw in, a free kick going St Kilda's way to Rodney Galt. Galt swings the ball up towards the centre, just wide of centre. Dietrich up there, but Kelvin Moore, a great player for the Hawks, takes a good mark over Dietrich. Very steady in defence, sixth mark to Kelvin Moore today. A drop punt by Moore up towards Hawthorne's half-forward line. Hudson sets himself and takes it. Hudson's taken the mark on the half-forward line, about 75 yards out from goal, needing one goal to create a new VFL record for goal-kicking in one season. Peter Hudson, a long kick, it's going to land in the 10-yard square, just outside, up they go, they punch it away, goes to Ken Beck, he punches further field, picked up by Teddy, oh, he's about to have a shot for goal when he was collared by this and killed the defence, and the ball forced over the line for throw-in. 23 minutes gone, and De Hawthorne unbelievably lead by 13 points after being down all day. From that throw-in, it goes to Moran. His kick goes, well, doesn't get his kick, it's deflected out to Lawrence. Lawrence's kick out towards the outer side. Trot and Ma doing battle. Trot's got the front position, but Ma socks it over the ground, and there'll be a throw-in on the outer side, right in front of bay number 19. Well, the Hawthorne camp down in front of us, John Kennedy and co have really come alive in this final quarter. From that throw-in, it goes up towards Wilson, but the ball again is forced over the line. St Kilda seemed to have the game in the bag at three-quarter time, but it's fallen away from them. From that throw-in, knocked down by Gop, but not a very effective one, and the ball for the third time, no, it's very close, yes it is, it's out, for the third time in 30 seconds, has gone out in more or less the same position. 24 minutes gone in the grand final, Hawthorne lead by 13 points, at this stage, it looks as though it's Hawthorne's flag for 1971. Big tap down by uh, Dietrich. It goes up towards uh, 
Smith, but Dedrick comes in, tries to get the ball off the ground, picked up by Trot. A left foot kick up towards the wing, punched away by Kelvin Moore. Good play by Moore. Wilson overruns the ball, and the ball's gone very close to the boundary line. In fact, there'll be a throw in once more in that same position on the outer side, with Hawthorne just slightly into attack. We're into time off now in the final quarter. 25 minutes have gone. Hawthorne's lead is 13 points. The ball out towards the half back line for St Kilda, taken by Travis Pays. Pays boots St Kilda into attack towards the half forward line, but Bustle's there for Hawthorne. Bustle to boot Hawthorne out of defence. Pump kick to the centre wing, out of side, and the mark is taken by, not taken by Des Barth, bounced off his chest. But Moore's there to back him up. His kick high in the air to the half forward line. It's close to the boundary line, and it's out of play, but not on the full. A boundary throw in. Only about four or five minutes remaining in the grand final for 1971. It looks like Hawthorne's flag taken by Elliott. Elliott back towards the centre wing. Opportunity for Theodore. He can't collect the ball. Down to the ground he goes. Davis is there to back him up. Davis to Boots and Kilda back into attack towards the half forward line. But it's all Hawthorne. Stevenson barges his way through the pack. Running towards the centre. Has a bounce and loses it. Three St Kilda players converge on him now. It's taken by Stephen Ray. He can't break clear of the pack. And umpire Shields is going to call for a bounce. 26 minutes of play now in the final quarter. 13 point lead to Hawthorne. Pays to Boots and Kilda into attack towards the full half forward line, Barry Breen in possession handball by Breen, back to Pays Pays won't give up, punt kick by Travis Pays, in towards Minot and he can't mark the ball, there's nobody home for St Kilda, it's all Hawthorne and Bremner clears, Bremner's kick to the centre wing, towards Rice Rice can't break clear of the tackle, now he can because uh, Ray fell over Rice towards the half forward line for Hawthorne it's all St Kilda there, Basanko charges into the pack Neil Basanko can't pick it up, but he's got plenty of pace. Look at him go from the centre. Basanko drives and Kilda towards the half-forward line, but that's where it all ends. David Parkin takes the mark. Well, I don't know what he fell over for, because that uh, little tackle by the St Kilda player couldn't have possibly hurt. Saves a bit of time, I think, Pete. That's right. And a 15-yard penalty. Parkin almost in the centre now, booting towards the half-forward line. Opportunity now for Dietrich. Dietrich from half back, booting towards the half forward line for St Kilda. And the boundary line is the winner. A throw in, half forward line for St Kilda. 26 27 minutes of play now in the final quarter. It's 82 to 69. A 13 point lead to Hawthorne, and the grand final looks like being theirs for 71. Bremner, he boots Hawthorne out of danger again towards the centre of the ground, and Matthews has the mark. Matthews to drive Hawthorne into attack. A short kick towards half forward finds Barr. Barr, who's been a real burner in this final quarter, boots in towards goal. He's got Hudson. Hudson's got it, and here it comes. This could be 151 for the year. Hudson looked to have no chance of breaking that long standing record, but now from point blank range, he can seal the premiership for 1971 and also be the league's largest goal kicker in the history of VFL football. Well, that's justice, isn't it? It is, Roy. Only 10 yards out. Let's hope he doesn't miss it. 151 coming up for Hudson. Oh! oh he's kicked into the man on the mark. He kicked into the man on the mark, and it's out of bounds. You can see it coming. He was going too close to the man on the mark. A boundary throw in. Over the back, it's knocked for St Kilda. Opportunity for Moran. Moran breaks clear of the tackle. Boots out towards the centre wing to Stewart. Trot and Trot will get a free kick. Trot just wide or midway between half back line and centre wing. 28 minutes of play. Time has gone for the Saints. Trot. Punt kick by that player to the centre wing. And the mark almost there to St Kilda. Taken away by Bonnie. Bonnie from the centre wing. He's been unsighted this quarter. Boots St Kilda deep into attack towards full four towards Breen. And Cowboy Neal. Taken by Breen. He's running into an open goal. He's put it through. It's a goal to St Kilda. The difference is seven points. That's his third, Peter. 28 and a half minutes of play and Hawthorne 12 tens and Kilda 11 9 the difference is only seven points and what tremendous strain on this center bounce knock St Kilda has to win it big Carl in the rush with Galt down goes the ball in comes Don Scott wins the tap down again what a brilliant game this fellow's played in towards uh, centre half forward it goes a chance for Matthews he gets it to Hudson Hudson's at centre half forward one bounce here's goal number 151 and he's missed it missed it, it. Oh, he's again. it he jellied at the last moment and he's missed it from 20 yards out he's kicked it out of bounds Darrell well you could see the butterflies on Peter Hudson as he stammered and stuttered as he got to that centre half forward mark and he out of bounds on the fall 
Still only 150 goals to Hudson. And almost a mark to uh, Angus. And Angus gets the free kick at centre-half oh. forward. And will he look for the pass to Peter Hudson? They're only seven points up. It would be a dangerous move. Well, the 151 goals looks as though it's eluded Peter Hudson. As Angus has it at centre-half forward. A long punt kick by Angus up towards the goal line. And it's through for a goal. No, it's not. It's marked. It appeared to be over the line. There. But the umpire has paid the mark right on the line to Rodney Galt. 30 minutes gone, Farrell. 30 minutes gone. Galt drives it to the grandstand side. Not a good kick. Stevenson pushed uh, Minot out of the way. It goes to Ray, but he is free bundled kick. over the line and he'll get the free kick for interference against Rice of Hawthorne. Stephen Ray dummies around Rice on the mark. He's on half-back flank now, drives it towards half-forward flank. Moore is behind Davis, punches it away very cleverly. Up goes Stevenson, punches it down to Bremner, and Hawthorne go into attack again, and the mark is taken by Scott, the Tyler Scott, best player on the ground in my book, at centre wing position. And he's slowing down the, the Hawks, steadying the Hawks at the vital period in this last quarter. 31 minutes of play gone, and Don Scott has it centre wing as the Hawks lead by seven points up towards centre half forward a chance for Hudson to mark it Galt is there he's trying to pick up the ball eventually he does it centre half back drives it out to the centre wing position with Porter getting under it and he's marked at centre wing out of side 12-10-82 Hawthorne 11-9-75 St Kilda and it's uh, Wilson getting the ball up towards Hudson Hudson's in front but punched away by Lawrence and I would say that Bob Pratt's uh, record has eluded uh, Peter Hudson he's equaled it but it seems pretty hard to imagine that he'll break it now. Siren about the sound. Big tap down by Gold too, but there's no one there. Kick off the ground by St Kilda. Goes to uh, Theodore. He's in trouble. Gets the handball across to Elliot. St Kilda going forward now. Up towards centre half forward. A chance here. Off the hands of the pack. Oh, Breen slipped over the crucial moment. A chance here for Bonnie. If he can break clear, he could have a show. There's no one up in the 10-yard square. What's happened? Holding the ball against Bonnie. And the free kick going Hawthorne's way at centre-half back. Well, Bonnie got his kick in. There wasn't one player within 40 yards up to the goal line. And if Bonnie had got enough strength into that kick, he could have put it through. But, of course, the free kick was against him going to Kelvin Moore. Kelvin Moore's drop punt up towards the half-back line, off the hands of the pack. Uh, Wilson's got the front position at the moment. He picks it up. A left foot kick by Wilson in towards Bosanko. And also, Bosanko nearly pulled down the mark. Uh, he's being paid by umpire Shields. Hawthorne 12 10 82 St Kilda 11 9 75 they've played 32 minutes in the final term nearly a Travis Pace mark St Kilda get it out it goes to Judson he's pushing the back and Judson will take the free kick and the siren will sound any second to voice a Hawthorne premiership 15 yard penalty going against Hawthorne to be taken by Judson this will bring him up to the half back line not a good kick up towards the wing, off the hands of the pack, a chance here for Porter, a left foot kick up towards the half forward line, and there it is, there it is, Hawthorne of Premiers for 1971 by seven points. A final score, Hawthorne 12-10-82, St Kilda 11-9-75, and there's John Kennedy, Bob Kenny coming in, Kenny kicked four goals, and the Don Scott coming in and giving Kenny a great big hug. And also John Kennedy there too. Alan Jeans, very disappointed, went across and uh, shook hands with John Kennedy. It seems hard to believe that Hawthorne have won the grand final because St Kilda were so much on top for two full quarters. We're just saying, Peter Thorold and I, the strength of uh, Don Scott, he picked up John Kennedy with one arm. And he's rucked all day. Hawthorne's flag for 1971. The final score is repeating... A win by seven points after trailing by 20 points at three-quarter time. Hawthorne, 12-10, 82, St Kilda, 11-9, 75. An extraordinary fight back from Hawthorne to win its second premiership. And, gee, they have gone on to have great success from that point onwards. But 28 points down in the third quarter and Hawthorne getting over the line by seven points 12 10 82 to 11 9 75. Alistair Nicholson, Matt Clinch, and Mark McClure with you on Vintage Grandstand. Hope you've enjoyed reliving the commentary from the ABC archives. There's one man we haven't spoken to today who was such a key part of the build up to and the day itself, the 1971 grand final. And that, of course, is Peter Hudson. And I'm happy to say he's joined us on the line. Welcome, Peter. 
Thanks, Alistair. Nice to be on the line. It's great to be with you. Um, obviously, a lot of water's gone under the bridge since the 1971 grand final, Peter, and everyone we've spoken to today, it, it seems strange we've asked you to come on, given you can't remember too much of the, the game, given the first quarter <laughs> incident. But but when you think about 71 now, what, what do you reflect upon? Well, it's, it's one of the most unusual things that has ever happened in my lifetime that, you know, I've been able to play in a premiership team and uh, to be quite frank and I'm being brutally honest I can't remember it and there's hardly a thing I can remember about the whole day uh, and most of what I know about it is what people have told me and uh, also watching watching the replay a number of times as you do over a, a, such a long period of time um, but I you know watching the replay I, I, I agree with what was said at the finish of the commentary that yeah it was an amazing comeback um, to get up from where we were and of course yeah the amazing effort by Bob Ketty in that last quarter to kick four goals and uh, and also there were some wonderful individual efforts you know particularly from in that last quarter you know Don Scott's mm. effort was just superb and um, you know Lee Matthews everybody sort of lifted from. Um, but once again, as I say, I can only go on what on hearsay. <laughs> Which is ext- that was your only premiership um, that you played in, in Peter, and, and extraordinary to think that you can't remember it. I did read that at, at points in the game, you, when you looked at the scoreboard, you could make out a few of the numbers, but the rest was a blur. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. That's exactly how it was. Uh, but once again, even that, that memory is is very very vague and. Uh, uh, but I mean that's yeah, that's the way it is when uh, when you have that sort of incident you know your your, your vision can be quite blurred and um, but uh, yeah that I mean, was a, an amazing day yeah but you, I've, I've said many many times in the years that have gone by uh, that uh, people um, may not be able to appreciate it but yeah what. Uh, the thing about it was that how much when Paul, my son, played in the Premiership side in 1991, exactly 20 years later, I lived that day, I think, through him, you know, to uh, uh, to, uh, to see that grand final. And, you know, I mean, there are very few fathers and sons that have played in Premiership teams of the same club. But uh, it, it really hit home to me 20 years down the track when Paul played, uh, you know, what it must have been like uh, back in 1971. Hutto, you had an incredible year as a football club. You finished on top of the ladder, win 19 games. Your percentage is 153. It's it's extraordinary how, how good a team you were. And the next best was St Kilda with 144, 140 uh, percentage and, and 16 games. So you're three games ahead and you struggled almost to get over the line. It was a pretty tough match and we all understand that. But you must be really proud of, of what you achieved as well with the 150 goals. Yeah, well, it, 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 Mark, it was... It, the build-up, when I look back on it, you know, I mean, yeah, you can appreciate the build-up to a grand final, but you know, to have the build-up to a grand final like that and then be three goals off the record, and, uh, um, yeah, I saw a terrible lot of Bob Pratt in that week. Because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and a good man, too. That's a lovely man. Every, everywhere I turned, he seemed to be there, and, uh, uh, yeah, because the, the media... Um, did a really good job of making sure the two of us mm. uh, spent a lot of time together in that week. But it, yeah, looking back on it, 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 it was a big build-up. It was a, a, a big occasion and 118,000 people. Mm. Uh, yeah, so it sort of had all the ingredients. But, of course, like everybody else, you, you probably don't appreciate it that much at the time uh, or as much at the time as you do now, you know, mm. 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the track. So, Peter, you, within that game, you, you kicked three before half time. You'd kicked 26 goals in three games against St Kilda that season. So everyone thought you were going to break the record and you looked on track at, at half time. And I know you can't remember exactly what took place in the game, but when you look back at the footage of it, can you believe that you actually weren't able to break the record given the circumstances, the hand pass from Keddie that where well, you did kick the goal and then it had to be brought back? There's the, the Barry Lawrence smother on the mark. You had a couple of other very good opportunities at well, as well. When you watch that back, sort of what goes through your mind? <laughs> um, well, it, look, I, I can't ever remember kicking into the man on the mark uh, apart from that time. And uh, like... 
I used to go back a long, long way. Not not as far as Ben Brown, but I used to go back a long <laughs> way. Uh, but, uh, then I had a shot that that um, went out on the full from dead in front. Mm. And then I think, well, gee, you know, how bad was that? And how bad was it to kick into the man on the mark? But but in all fairness, if you can't remember it, uh, you know, there must have been something something amiss somewhere. Yep. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, they, but the old karma train, you know, the fact that that um, that I couldn't uh, couldn't perform uh, at that level uh, made it that Bob Ketty went to full forward and uh, almost won the game off his own boot. Can I say this to you? Would you prefer to win the game and kick 150 and not break the record or would you prefer to lose a game and kick 151? <laughs> That's uh, a point of question. Mate, well, it's a very easy answer, mate. <laughs> yes, it um, is. Yeah. Uh, now, look, I, I've i thought about it a lot over the years. Um, yeah, I, I actually went to Bob Pratt's funeral, mm. and it hit me like a ton of bricks at the funeral that how good it was that I, uh, that I could equal it. Like, I mean, who wouldn't want to be bracketed with Bob Pratt? As, you know, if there are only two people that have kicked 150 goals, who wouldn't want to be bracketed with Bob Pratt? That's the way I looked at it. But as I say, it probably hit me that day like a ton of bricks that I was glad I didn't break it because he went to his grave holding the record and I had the great honour of holding it jointly with him. Mm. And, um, you know, I mean, in a funny sort of way, I know it's a different kettle of fish altogether, but it also came home to roost when... Mark Ward, did, uh, Mark Taylor did yeah. what he did. Yeah, that came um, in the mind a second ago. Yeah, and and let's face it, Bob Pratt deserved to have that record because he played less games than I did. Um, and uh, as I say, you, you know, it's just such an honour to, to share it with him. Peter no. Hudson's with us on Vintage Grandstand. Uh, Peter, it's Matt Clinch here. You kicked 100 goals in four consecutive seasons between 1968 and 1971, and then in 1977 went to keep the ton once more. It seems remarkable in today's era. What was the key to your success during that period? Well, for a, for a good period of, of that period, well, uh, it didn't hurt that John Kennedy came up with a game plan where everybody pushed up the ground <laughs> and left me one out with the full bag. <laughs> <laughs> I had half of Glen Ferry Oval to myself. Um, I mean, mind you, it was a bit scary if, when the ball came out of the centre. It was like the charge of the light brigade, all the players getting down into the forward line. And uh, but uh, but and of course, you know, some some of the younger people wouldn't realise that that game style had a, I think, a heck of a lot to do with the, the centre square because uh, we were so strong in the middle, particularly when you had one Lee Matthews in there. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, but we had our whole half forward line was up to the centre, and everybody was up there except me. And um, they they brought in the diamond. I don't know whether yeah, you I remember remember, remember the diamond. Yeah, well that that was yeah that didn't work all that well. And then in, in, <laughs> none in of them work the well. <laughs> Sorry, all those things they put up don't work well. <laughs> <laughs> but then they brought in the centre square. So, um, but. Uh, you know, that, that had a lot to do with it. And, and I mean, John Kennedy, crikey, anybody that played under him or anybody that knew him knew that he was generations ahead of his time. What made him so good in, in your mind, Peter? Well, I think he, his whole approach to everything was, you know, was very, very straightforward. It was, you know, like, um, we, we, we didn't, of course, in those days, you didn't have... Uh, you know, all the scientific uh, backup that they've got these days and all the st- uh, data and statistics and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, the whole idea with John was, you know, just get the ball and get it down there as quick as you can. <laughs> to <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and open up space, which is a very yeah. clever idea with a, on a yeah. guy who, you know, never took a mark over your head. Do you ever take a mark over your head, Hutter? Well, the, yeah, I did. I did. There was when? a book they brought. There was, there was a book <laughs> came out with a hundred greatest marks, and I thought, oh, well, just, there's no way, no, no, I'll figure in that. But I was actually in it twice. And, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> took a good one hander in the grand final. Um, you mentioned Lee Matthews, who was 19 during the 1971 grand final, but the, the physical way that he was playing the game, there's a, perhaps too physical at times, Peter, when he takes out Stuart Trotter at one point, but. Um, for a 19-year-old to play the way that he did, 
how aware were you of, of what he would become at that stage of his career? Well, when he first came to the club, of course, he was only a, a baby and uh, it didn't take long to realise that he had something very, very special. And, and um, But he, he never... I, didn't, I don't think he ever played any different... From when he was 18 or 19 until he finished his career, I don't think he's... Uh, he changed his game at all. Uh, he was just hard at it. And I often say these days that when I go to bed every night, say, I say my prayers and I thank the Lord that I played with, with him. Lee Matthews and Kelvin <laughs> for another game. So. <laughs> Peter, I've always wanted to ask you this. I know your memory of the 1971 grand final is not as good, but what about your memory of arriving in a helicopter at Waverley? I've always wondered about what that experience would have been like. <laughs> yeah, it was it was quite a story. Um, the um, it, it was it, I was approached to play a game against Collingwood at Waverley, and it was about the third last game of the year, I think. And Hawthorne had to win it to um, to get into the finals, and I'm pretty sure it was a final four still then. Mm. And I got I was contacted by John Kennedy to see if I'd play, and I said, "Oh, geez, John, I've got a problem there." I said, "I haven't." Didn't play for the whole of 1972, and this is the third last game in 1973. Um, I don't think I'm going to be in too good a condition because I haven't touched the football in all that time. And uh, he said, well, I'll come down to Hobart. He said, and see how you are. So I came down. We re- went to a school ground. I ran from one set of goalposts to the other. <laughs> was blowing like a draft horse. He said, oh, he said, a bit worse than I thought. He said, <laughs> So he said, what we'll do, we'll give it a fortnight and um, uh, then we'll see how you are and we'll make a decision then. And uh, so I trained for a whole fortnight and uh, <laughs> and anyway, the big day came and Hawthorne said, we'll fly over on Friday afternoon and we'll, um, you know, you play the game and then we'll get you straight back on a flight back to your hotel in Hobart for Saturday night because they knew how big a night that would be. And I said, I can't come on the Friday. They said, why is that? I said, uh, Norman Gunson's appearing at my hotel. <laughs> <laughs> so they said, right, well, what we'll do, uh, yeah, I, there was going to be a hell of a crowd there, and I said, what, what, they said, what we'll do, we'll fly you over Saturday morning, and uh, and to be sure of getting out to the ground on time, out at Waverley, we'll get a helicopter. And so um, my wife and I jumped in the helicopter, and they had some lunch in the helicopter for us, and we went out, and we landed in the what is now the police academy. <laughs> Yeah, so. And yet, and kicked eight. He kicked eight. Yeah. Kicked eight. Poor old Jeff, Jeff Clifton. Marks. Did, did Jeff Clifton well, know you were playing that day? Did, <laughs> did he know? Yeah. Well, well, Mark, you know, the, in all your career, like uh, some days the, the football gods are with you, and some days they aren't. No, and, a lot uh, of days they weren't. <laughs> no, no, that day they were all there. Yeah. So, <laughs> how was your body, Hutto, after that game? Uh, well, they, the, the injury that kept me out uh, it was a. Uh, what happened, I played, and the cartilage went in my knee. Um, so that was going to be the only game I could play. And then uh, like, the rest of it's history. But I was still lucky enough, and I always you know, thank my lucky stars that I was able to do it, was I got stuck into it in 1977, and I flew over every weekend from Hobart. So imagine this day and age where you never train with the team and you fly in every Friday afternoon back in your hotel in Hobart on Saturday night at... Um, uh, you know, after the game. Like a Hollywood superstar. <laughs> <laughs> I made the mistake one night, Mark, under the showers. I sang out to all the players who were having the shower. I said, oh, look, God, fellas, drinks are on me at the Granada Tavern, which is my hotel, hotel tonight. In, yeah, in Hobart. So, yeah, I'm going to be the only one there, of course. And <laughs> anyway, a few months later, one of the barmaids rang me out in our flat at the hotel and said that, Group of guys out here, they've all ordered top shelf and none of them are going to pay. <laughs> <laughs> they all come to Hobart for some reason. It took me up on it. Who was the... I mean, you said Norman Gunston there, but your, your venue um, in Hobart was famous for the acts that you had, Peter, performing there. Who would you say was the most famous band or performer you had during that period? Oh, well, we had the biggest room in Hobart, Alistair, and, and so when the bands came down, we got there, you know, they came to our hotel and... And we had a lot of the big acts when they came down. With Billy Connolly appeared there one night, wow. um, and uh, of course Norman Gunston, Ernie Sigley, and Denise. Uh, <laughs> and um, we had uh, uh, Joe Joseph and the Falcons. That, that band, the best 
the best act that we ever had in the hotel, in my opinion, was Little River Band when they came wow. down. Yeah, yeah that was sensational. But but all those sorts of acts that came down. Um, well, yeah, we had Paul Hogan. He, he oh, yeah. there. Yep. Yeah, Delvine. Yeah, no, no, not Delvin, just Paul. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Peter, you've had a, a, obviously a magnificent career, and, and to think that you kicked over 700 goals in it when you played, you know, only 129 games, averaged 5.64 goals a game, absolutely superb, a deserved yeah. legend in the Australian Football Hall of Fame as well, and, and a real treat for us to spend some time with you on Vintage Grandstand, reliving what memories you do have uh, of the 1971 Grand Final. So thanks for your company. Been a pleasure. Well done, Pete. Good job. Peter Hudson there talking to us on, on Vintage Grandstander. Whenever I hear his voice, he's got such a um, a voice. As soon as you hear it, you know who it is, and, and I just cannot stop listening to him. He's such a fascinating character in football. When you think that he went back and kicked over 200 goals in a season mm. with Glenorchy as, as well in, in the Tassie Footy League. What a player. I'll never forget the day they flew him over. I remember watching on TV and I was, I'd, I'd finished playing, I'd gone back home and they showed it on TV and I think it might have been on the winners and all those sorts of things as well and, and I've gone, have a look at him, he's, he's, he's overweight, he stood, he waddled around and I tell you, it was incredible, he waddled around and he, he, he all of a sudden, <laughs> bang, it landed in his arms and you go, oh, I'm lucky again, you know, this is how it works, he's an amazing player. We've had a little bit of fun and some of the stories that have come. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did reliving it to you. We might come back next Saturday and have another crack at it. What do you reckon, Al? Let's go and have a look on the shelves, Clinty. So the 1971 Grand Final.